commission meeting. Does anybody have any comments or revisions to the minutes? And if not, is anyone willing to make a motion? I'll move that we approve the minutes from the last meeting. Okay, thank you, Maureen. A motion by Maureen. I'll second. And a second by Brenda. Okay, we'll go through the roll call. Uh, Maureen? Yes. Amy? Yes. John? Yes. Uh, Andreas? Abstain. Brenda? Yes. Sarah? Yes. And then has Matt joined? Yes. Yes. I don't know why it says my son's name and I can't figure out how to change it. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah. I've reached that point in my life and my son can apparently do something that I can't fix on a computer. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Motions. Well, it's just like Emerson, <laughs> aka Matt, is with us. Yes. <laughs> All right. I get spotty you, self, a service where I'm not sure if they told you, so I might, my video might be on and off throughout the meeting, depending on my connection. Okay. Okay. Motion passes six in favor. Um, next, we have the report of the chair and the vice chair. Um, I have nothing to report. Brenda, do you have anything to report? I do not. Okay, now we will move on to the report of the director. And we have a couple of items on our agenda under the director's report. And Michaela, is this you or who's, who's or Kelsey, I guess, is doing the first one, which is the Union Pacific time extension request? Yeah, I can jump in if, if that's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so this is a time extension request for the Union Pacific Hotel. They received a plan development approval in 2018, as well as a conditional building and site design review approval. You have granted one extension for the plan development in 2019, and they are needing an extension for the uh, conditional building and site design review now, just design review as well. Uh, the applicant has expressed this ex needing this extension due to the um, current economy and hotels. So um, it is mostly COVID related, <laughs> um, like everything else right now. But uh, Mark Sanford is the applicant and he is available to answer any questions if you have any this time. And I can go ahead and unmute him if you had any questions for him. Great, right, thank you. Any questions for the applicant from anyone? I will just add that the this petition does still need to go back to landmarks for final approval of the sign package. The design was approved by landmarks, um, I believe in 2019, the final approval. Okay. okay. Um, there are no questions for either Kelsey or the applicant, is someone willing to make a motion? I'll make the motion. And since it sounds like they're trying to get this done, they're going through the landmarks, they're, they're working on it. Um, and it's a big complex project. I'll move that we give them an extent, a time extension. Okay. I'll second that. All right, so that was a motion by Maureen and a second by Sarah. Let's go through our vote. Um, I'll start with Sarah. Uh, yes. Brenda. Brenda. Yes. Thank you. Andreas. Yes. Matt. Yes. 
John. Yes. Amy. Yes. Maureen. Yes. Okay, motion passes unanimously. And for the record, these are case numbers PLN SUB 2018-00617 and PLN SUB 2018-00618. Madam Chair, we also have yeah. Commissioner John Lee. Uh, I didn't hear oh, him. Oh, John, sorry. How did I skip over you? I went backwards. Um, I thought I said yes. Okay. Well, you may have, you may have not, but we got it now. All right, now the motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you, thank you Kelsey. Um, then the other item under the director's report was the Edison House conditional use time extension request, which is case number PLN PCM 2019-00671. This is Wayne. I will uh, present this one quickly. The uh, Edison House conditional use was approved by the Planning Commission October 9th, 2019. Um, details on the project are located in the documents in your Dropbox as well as in the Planning Commission website. The developers are requesting a one-year extension for the conditional use approval. They've actually submitted building permit plans, which would typically validate the conditional use approval, but in this case, they're trying to work out some pretty complex issues related to the development, and they just want to ensure that the uh, conditional use permit stands um, while they are trying to work out these issues. The uh, developer applicant is Charlie Carden. He's um, in the attendee list if you do have any questions. Thank you, Wayne. Any questions for the applicant? Or for Wayne on the request. If there are no questions, I move that we extend the application for another year. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Sarah and a second by Matt. Any other discussion? <laughs> okay, we'll go to the vote. Maureen. Sorry, I'm the mute button. Um, yes. Okay, Amy? Yes. John? Yes. Matt? Yes. Matt? Yes. Oh, yes, you come through. Yeah, got it. Andreas? Yay. Brenda? Yes. Sarah? Uh, yes. Okay, um, motion passes unanimously, extension approved. Okay. Now Madam Chair, yes. before you move on from the director's report, and this is along the same lines of these extensions, um, we anticipate a, a significant number of extension requests over the next, who knows how long. <laughs> uh, everything's taking longer um, for, for obvious reasons. Um, and we were wondering if the Planning Commission would uh, be interested in at your next meeting taking action that would provide a general extension to anything that's expiring during the period of the public health emergency declaration that we're in, um, just to help alleviate some of that, that concern and those issues and the bottlenecks that may come up. I think if the commission is, we'll put something together that outlines those reasons and a time frame, um, and then we have because it's an it would be an official action. It would have to be posted on an agenda, so we would do that at your next meeting if that's something the commission is interested in. And if not, we'll just bring bring them back as they come up. And either way, we just we just thought it might be an opportunity to to maybe um, streamline some things. So, Nick, is it possible that this could be one of the examples we use as a Consent agenda. Uh, sure, absolutely. We could just add extensions on there and go for it. That's that certainly is an opportunity. I do kind of like seeing them come through again because I'm always wondering, did this just fall off the map and it's not going to happen? I mean, I'm glad to see Union Pacific Hotel and Edison House both 
that they're still moving forward. So I kind of like to see them, but I don't, I agree with Brenda. If they're all on a big list together and we do it all at once, that doesn't break my heart. So Sarah, if you got a report in the director's report of the ones that they've, they've dealt with, would that suffice or it would. would you like to? No, you're actually right. That, that would do it for me. But in the consent agenda, we could take one of them off the agenda if we if there was any issue with it at all. Correct. Whereas with it's just a director list, I'm not sure how we would do that. Well, they would still be listed and individually in the consent agenda. It would yes. just we wouldn't be hearing them each individually, but what is covered by the would be described. So that's why I'm suggesting a consent agenda rather than a director report. Right. Now I hear you. I, I see what is, you're saying. Is there a lot of time that takes in preparing the staff reports for these extensions? Or are they pretty quick to pull together and all that? No, we generally don't don't create much for, for an extension. It's it's typically just at most a, a memo outlining the reasons why. Um, and that and that's about it. And you, you probably even if we were to approve generally, you probably still have a memo draft of some kind outlining the reasons why you're extending or correct? Correct, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Correct. But the, the consent agenda idea works well too, because then we can just put them on there. It's a simple motion to approve the consent agenda. And if there's any dissent or anything like that, that item can be discussed and everything else can be approved. And that that, that would, I mean, I don't imagine many of those would have a discussion, but uh, it, it would all, it's a matter of minutes. Yep. Sounds good to me. Great. All right, that's good because then we don't need to do anything and we'll just proceed with putting those on consent agendas when we get them. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Um, the other thing that this is. Yeah, go ahead, Michaela. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is I know it's such an incredibly busy time and it's going to get busier. Um, and we want to be sensitive to how many items around the planning commission agendas. And as you know, those are filling up towards the end of the year. Marlene has sent out a doodle poll um, for a possible December 2nd meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, so if everyone could look at their schedules and reply back to her to see if that's an option, um, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michaela. And that would be in addition to the meeting on the 9th in December. It would go the 2nd, the 9th, and then nothing the rest of the month. Is that the idea? That's the idea. Okay. In addition. In addition. Thank you. Okay. We will promptly respond to the doodle poll. Um, anything else? On the director's report? I do not have anything else. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll now move into the public hearing portion of our agenda. Um, and the first item on the agenda is a height and grade change special exception at approximately 333 North Federal Heights Circle, is case number PLN PCM 2020 um, And I'm going to recuse myself due to a potential conflict of interest and let Brenda take it from here. So Chrissy, uh, Chrissy, Christina Gilmore is the staff uh, ready to present. Yep. Yeah, I'm assuming you can see my screen, but please let me know if you can't. So this is a request from Scott and Jennifer Huntsman, the property owners, to construct a new single family home that exceeds the maximum per permitted building height and maximum allowed grade change in the FR3 12,000 foot Hills residential district. Um, the subject property is located at 333 North Federal Heights Circle and is currently vacant. Um, in the FR3 zone, 
A building can be up to 28 feet in height measured from the established grade. And the requested grade changes exceed the allowed four feet in the rear yard and six feet in the buildable area. Uh, the Planning Commission is the final decision making authority for the requested special exceptions. The subject property is located in Federal Heights and is the last lot to be developed in on Federal Heights Circle, as shown in yellow. The property has fairly significant slopes, with most of the site between 20 and 35 percent slope. And of note, the, the site is also fairly large. The lot is just over 31,000 square feet. Um, the subject property is shown in this photo at the bottom, and it attempts to show you the slope, but it's kind of hard to see unless you've been out to the site. But the slope is mostly the steepest at the front of the lot towards the beginning of the circle, and then um, not quite as steep as you get to the back, but it, it's still fairly steep. So due to the existing slope of the property, the construction of the single family home requires some fill and cutting that exceeds the four foot limitation in the required rear yard area. Um, the, the gray changes that exceed four feet in the rear yard are intended to provide for a flat usable lawn area. And the grade change will go from approximately two feet to eight feet below established grade and will require an eight to 10 foot retaining wall. Um, the wall will not be readily visible from the public way um, due to the location of the grade change in the rear yard. And as mentioned in your staff report, significant grading and retaining walls are very common in this area. And this one is in the rear yard, so it shouldn't have quite as much of an impact. Um, this area highlighted in red on your screen is where that grade change, change is needed in the rear yard, as well as on this bottom photo, it shows um, looking from the west where that grade change is. So the requested grade change in the buildable area that exceeds six feet in dimension are located to the rear of the property to accommodate the slope of the driveway. Um, the proposed driveway closely follows the existing grade and maintains a manageable slope of under 10% without requiring retaining walls. Um, the applicant went through several iterations of their design and placement of the garage to try to keep the driveway from being too steep as well as minimizing the impact from the street view. And so locating the garage on the side of the house does require some small areas around the garage to be eight to 10 feet below established grade, which are shown in red as well on this image. So as far as the additional height, in the FR3 zoning district, um, it provides a height of 28, which is the existing grade. The FR3 zoning district does not distinguish building height between flat or pitched roofs. Um, both roof types, types are 28 feet. Um, the proposed single family residence has a roof with a step design to include a lower height at the street facing elevation. And the areas that exceed the height limitation are at the corners of the south facing roof overhangs. As described in the applicant's submittal, the south facing roof overhangs are sized to allow for sun in the winter and um, block sun during the summer. So these long overhangs combined with the, the steep slope of the site cause the southwest corner of each to exceed the established grade by two feet on the first floor and four feet nine inches on the second floor um, as highlighted in red and then shown it above in this image. And then these images are just intended to show you um, the street facing elevation as well as the east elevation where um, visually the impact will looks the same as if they were following the, the uh, height restriction of 28 feet. And the home does fit in every other way into the height restriction besides those two small areas of the roof. So as far as public input goes, um, staff did, and this is some background on the request, staff did originally approve the requested special exceptions administratively, but then following that approval, um, a concerned neighbor contacted me and let me know that there were some issues with the noticing because of delayed mail and possible uh, power outages during the windstorm. And that neighbor requested that we take this to a, pu a public hearing. So that's why we're before you today. Um, since that, since the publishing of your staff report, um, we did receive an email withdrawing the concern and that the applicant has worked with the neighbor to try and address those concerns. Um, part of that was removing some excessive grading and retaining walls, as well as reducing areas of additional height on the house. 
So to summarize, um, based on the input in the staff report, it is planning staff's opinion that the requested special exceptions for additional building height and grade changes in the FR3 zoning district comply with the standards of approval and recommend the planning commission approve the proposed exceptions. So that concludes my presentation and um, the applicant is on the, the line as well. Thank you. Would the applicant like to add anything to the staff report? Um, Brenda, I have a brief clarification for Kelsey. Sure, I'm sorry, Amy, sure. Um, so are you telling us that you had um, approved all these administratively, but because of the neighbor's um, response, it's coming to us, but then he's withdrawn that response I saw in Dropbox, correct? So, yeah, so um, did, did the applicant make adjustments that aren't reflected in your staff report then? No, so he just made the staff report and we're now comfortable with those changes. I'm sorry, there's quite a bit of feedback that I'm hearing that I'm not sure where it's from. Um, and since we had already noticed the meeting, we thought that it was best to just keep the item on the agenda in case there were other people here to speak. Oh, okay. Thanks, Chrissy. Mm -hmm. Brenda, you're muted. Sorry, uh, Commissioner Shear. Thank you. <laughs> uh, no. I'm not. Can you not hear me? We can. Okay. okay. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, would the applicant like to add anything? Yep. Uh, let me just stop sharing. Hi there. So, uh, can you hear? This is Jennifer Huntsman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I think, you know, mostly we'd like to address any questions or concerns of the commission. Um, our, um, I'm here today, my husband Scott's here in case there are questions. Also, our architect, Richard Moore, um, is on, and I think he has uh, some things to share. I just want to quickly say um, thank you to the planning staff, especially Chrissy Gilmore, who's kind of taken the laboring war on this. The staff has been fantastic to work with, very professional, responsive, knowledgeable. Um, it's been great. Thank you also to the commission. We know you have a, a very packed agenda and we're going to try and make this as efficient as we can but make sure we address any of your concerns i just want to say briefly um until a couple of years ago i've actually lived in federal heights in the neighborhood where this lot is for about 14 years um since my kids were teeny tiny my husband and i've been looking to move back to the neighborhood because well i'm we love a lot of things about the neighborhood um including the camaraderie among the neighbors and we had a, a good experience with the neighbor who raised a concern um, on this project where we were able to sit down with him and really work through the concerns. Um, and uh, our architect, Richard Moore, who's going to talk for just a few minutes, has worked pretty darn valiantly, we think, to avoid the need for a special exception um, on this, you know, very challenging lot. Uh, and, and after his uh, pretty tremendous creative effort and a lot of collaboration with our builder, um, we've, we've arrived at a design that is substantially smaller than the allow than allowable for this lot for most on most of the lot it's substantially under the maximum height restriction in almost all areas we don't have any soaring scenes or anything like that um, and we think it stays true to the character of the neighborhood which we love um, which is why we're moving back um, so i so if we have any questions that we can answer for you please let us know i'm going to hand this off though to my much more knowledgeable architect uh, richard moore so thanks thanks for your time on this thank you Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. I um, I just want to uh, echo what Jennifer said about um, all the help. Chrissy has really, she's spent a lot of time on the phone helping me understand the nuances of this process. So I just want to thank her and every everyone from the city has been really great. Um, the, the site is really tricky. There are a lot of constraints that are sort of pulling in different directions, and we've tried to find the right balance and to come up with a, a solution that's appropriate for the site. A couple um, kind of overarching ideas that influence the way we approach the design. Uh, so we, we wanted to minimize the amount of grading, the amount of excavating, the amount of retaining required uh, for various reasons. But um, so because of that, the, the first 80 feet the, the front 80 feet of the site 
that's where it's steepest and we're not building on that at all. So, so the house is, is set pretty, pretty far back from the street to avoid the steepest parts. Um, as, as Jennifer said, we, we are sort of, it's a relatively small footprint. Um, we've talked Scott into a two car garage rather than a three car garage. He originally wanted a three car. And, and we have a long driveway that does sort of follow the, the grade as much as possible. Again, to, to minimize the amount of, of retaining walls and the amount of, of grading that we need to do. Um, so I, th I think Chrissy did a, an excellent job at covering kind of the three main parts of the special exception. The uh, overall building height is really for energy efficiency. We're, we're just trying to, the, the site faces south and we just kind of want to take advantage of that. And those overhangs are, are designed and sized to to allow maximum sun in the winter and to block all of the sun in the summer. And, um, and so when we have these overhangs that project out and then the site slopes down pretty dramatically, it's only in that, in that corner where, where we exceed the 28 feet. And we, we have tried to, to kind of minimize the visual impact of that by, you know, keeping all of our, our ceiling heights at a reasonable, a reasonable height. Um, the, the gray changes for the driveway in the garage, I think uh, Chrissy and um, explained very well. We, we did, uh, like I said, we did want originally a three car garage, but we, we, we decided on a two car garage and we have um, tucked it in the back just so it's not, prominent on the front of the on the front of the house and as a result it just it cuts into the hillside in those in those two small areas and the the retaining wall in the back and the grade change in the back is is mostly because you know so much of the site is so steep and we're we're avoiding it that um we just wanted to level out the backyard a little bit so we have some usable yard area behind the house. Um, we've, the and you know, as Christy mentioned, it is hidden, any any retaining wall in the backyard is, is hidden from the street and from the neighbors. Uh, we do have, we've thought a lot about the, the neighbors and um, Jennifer and Scott have been very proactive in working with with the neighbors. We have uh, a good buffer of trees on the north and west sides of the property. On the on the south side or the side facing the street, we do have some tall mature trees and we're we're hoping to keep those. We are planning to to eliminate one of those for the driveway, but um, we would like to preserve those if possible. And on the east side, this was the neighbor who was concerned about his um, his view. I mean, and we we have uh, we have worked with well, they have worked with this neighbor and considered his his view corridors and made sure that we don't uh, that we were respectful of of the view from his property. Um, from his property, the house is, is well within, from the east side, it's well within the, the 28 foot height restriction. It's actually at, at the, at the least it's four feet below. Um, so we feel like it, it shouldn't have any impact on, in, on any of our neighbors, but, um, and I, I think that's, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Is there anyone who has any questions for the applicant? Hearing none, I will move to a public hearing. Is there anyone from the public who is here to address this particular item on the agenda, item number one? I do not see any hand coming up. Email. And nothing has come in via email. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further public comment, I'll close the public hearing. Is there any discussion from the Planning Commission? 
Madam Chair, I'm ready to make a motion. Thank you. Uh, based on the information in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve PLN PCM 2020-00639. I'll second. I have a motion from Amy and a second from Matt. Yes. Thank you. Um, so we'll just go with, with a with a uh, roll call here. Yeah, let's see if I can see that sign. Oh, okay. So Maureen? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Andreas? Yay. Um Matt? Yes. John? Yes. Amy? Yes. Is that everybody? Okay. The motion passes. Thank you. Unanimously. And now I'm going to turn the meeting back over to Adrian. Thank you, Brenda. Okay, moving on. Item number two on the agenda. Um, 800 South and State Street Design Review at approximately 754 South State Street. This is case number PLN PCM 2020-00439. And Nan is making the staff presentation for us. Thank you, Chair. The project site is located at approximately 754 South State Street in the downtown support zoning on the corner of 800 South and State Street. Planning Commission gave the applicant uh, direction on September 30th during a work session for the requested design modifications before the applicant finalized the design review proposal and returned to Planning Commission. The applicants with Kimball Investment and Colina Group are requesting three modifications to the design standards in the D2 district. The first is a modification to the number of operable building entrances along the street facing facades. The second, a modification to the maximum length of the street facing building facade. And the third is a request for additional building height. Staff received six comments from the public during the early public engagement phase and included those comments in the staff report. We also received five public comments after the report was finalized. Those comments were forwarded to the Planning Commission before this meeting. Staff has found that the proposed 800 South State Street design review meets the intent of the zoning district and the design review standards with the recommended conditions list, listed in the staff report and recommends that the Planning Commission approve the design review with the conditions one through six. I kept my presentation pretty short so that you're able to speak with the applicant um, and address the um, recommendations the Planning Commission discussed with the applicant during the work session. If you have any questions for me, I'll be on hand um, to address those questions. Great, thank you, Ann. Um, so we have the applicant here. Yeah, this is Abir, I'm here. And if I could just share my screen, I'd be happy to just walk you through the changes that we've made in light of the comments from the work session. Great. All right, let's see if I can do this. All right. Can everyone see that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, awesome. Well, first of all, thank you so much to everyone for your time and especially thanks to Nan for all of her late nights and putting this report together to get it to you all in time for this hearing. Really appreciate all of her work. Um, also, thank you to the planning commissioners for the work session. The comments were really valuable and I think we've got a better project as, as a result of that process. Um, you know, based upon the comments that we heard, the, the main issue that we're hearing is the facade length. And um, I want to talk to you about that today. Uh, let's see, can I go to the next slide? There we go. Um, 
the facade length uh, is long. We understand that. We know in the zone, um, it's supposed you want it to be 200 feet, and it's it's longer than that. The reasons for that are that we're developing a greater area than just this one parcel, which is parcel three on here, and that area is up against State Street, which is a UDOT road. And UDOT has some strict standards on how many public streets can intersect um, a UDOT road. And so based on that, we, we put the street, the public street to the north of our project that aligns with the midwalk block crosswalk. UDOT told us where that street should go. And so we worked with that to try to see what we could do to break up the facade even more. What we ended up doing was we um, inserted a private service alley. We know it's on a public street, but it is a private alley. And we feel like that sufficiently breaks up the facade. If the public road is going to be on the left side of this page, which is the north, and then you've got the service alley in the middle, the facade length between that public road and the service alley is 115 feet. And then the facade length from the service alley to the end of our building on 800 South is 198 feet. And so that's what we've done to break up the building. And I know, Amy, you had asked kind of how we treat that service alley in that gate. And I'll, I'll walk you through that here in a minute as well. Um, let's see, is this, yeah. Um, before I do that, real quick, John, you had mentioned in the work session um, to try to see what we could do to, to break up the, the building mass up above the ground. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to break up the building to make them look like different buildings. They are connected, but we've got this interior courtyard here that's pushed back. So from the street, it'll look like two separate buildings. And specifically, John, we address your comment of the balconies. And we created these shrouds around the balconies um, that'll not only give pedestrians, but also um, vehicles and people from across the street. It'll really ho hopefully break up this facade and make it look like it's a separate building. So that's one of the changes that we did. Now, getting back to the pedestrian experience, which Amy, that was one of your concerns. This is a shot of our new street and, and State Street. And this is where we're gonna have a two-story retail tenant. Um, we're hoping that it's a grocer, um, but we're gonna have a mid-block cross that comes, a mid-block crosswalk that crosses State Street here. And what we've done to really activate this is we've set the building back from the property line. And that allows us to have outdoor dining that's covered and really have this active edge. As you move further to the south along State Street, you can see here on the bottom right, you can see kind of where the outdoor dining ends. This is the service alley. And this is what we're doing to treat the service alley. Service alley will have a gate on it. And we really think that, that this is a great opportunity for us to bring in art. And this is just an, uh, an example of what the art could be. But the idea is to have it on the gate. And by the way, that gate, initially we had showed swing doors. We're actually doing an overhead coiling door. Um, but the art will not just be on the gate, it'll also turn and be on the wall. So it'll be engaging to pedestrians as well as cars that pass by. And it starts us to the transition over to the residential portion of the building. We've got the concrete stair tower here, which is board form concrete. And then Sarah, you had made a comment about really drawing attention to the residential lobby and we heard you what we did was we extended that expression we made it wider and we um, created an illuminated glass element to really highlight that entrance to the lobby that's a two-story volume lobby and we'll have a nice light fixture in there and you can start to see signage um, on that lobby designating where where residents should go as you continue further south on state street you start to get to what we call our maker's row. And this is our small retail um, locations in our building. And um, we've maintained the expression above that we had in the work, in the work session where we have um, the building facade above that kind of extends, it, it apparently looks like it extends um, the retail. So it, it shows some prominence and it distinguishes it from the end caps. Once you move further south from Maker's Row, you get down to the corner of 8 South in Maine, and we've got a two-story retail um, location here. I know there was a comment to try to distinguish that from what we had on the north side, but we really felt like we had a lot going on on this facade, and we wanted to make them look similar to really anchor these two corners. 
So this is the two-story volume of retail that we've got on 8th South in Maine. And then moving around to the A South facade, again, um, there was a comment to, tr to try to break up the facade. So what we did was instead of that brick extending in the middle, we have this break. And that break is doing two things. One, it's drawing more attention to the entrance and exit of the parking garage. And the other thing that it's doing is it actually gave us this idea to extend our dog run up there. So you'll people and their pets will have the ability to interact with people on the street. Um, and so we're really excited about that. And then, you know, Brenda, you, you had mentioned the West facade. We spent so much time talking about State Street. Let's talk about the West facade. And so here's kind of a shot of what's looking on the West facade. If you'll remember where we were showing this art, this is um, our transformers are behind this wall. And that's, um, that's what's going on there. This is a this is an image of the west facade, and um, one thing that's interesting to note on the right hand corner, that's going to be another developable lot. We don't know what we're going to build there, but there will be a building there, so we wanted to show a massing to designate that. But the comment here was really about the metal screen, and it looked like it was one long metal screen. And so what we did was we included this decorative element that's really kind of spilling down from the amenity deck above and it's going to be illuminated so it'll draw people's attention the the lights will be focused downwards part of the city's dark sky ordinance um, and so that'll be a cool element the other thing that we've done is we've put marquee signage above the leasing office entryway this is one of our primary entrances for when new and prospective residents come into the building and we wanted to differentiate it from the other retail entrances um, that you've seen in the other parts of the building. You'll also start to notice that in the middle of the image, we've got signage for parking, so cars know clearly where they need to go. And again, Sarah, if you go a little bit further south, you'll see that iconic glass element that'll be illuminated that um, will designate the Western resident entry. And on here as well, you'll start to see kind of the connections to the park in the mid block. You've got that mid block crosswalk and um, and the connection to the park there. So that starts to, to take shape on this side of the building. Here's a close up of that entrance. You can see how we've got outdoor dining right there to activate that space as well. Again, it's all about this living edge. Um, here's a shot of the building. You can start to see at night how the signage will be lit up, how this decorative element will be lit up. And I wanna focus on this corner of the building. This is another change that we've made. This originally was um, a co-working amenity space for our residences. And we're really starting to view this more as like a living room for the building. And we've set back the wall of that co-working space and created this really nice outdoor patio that'll overlook the park. Again, just trying to bring activation to the street face. Um, and this is just kind of more of the same as we're walking back around State Street. You can see our new street and you can see the colonnade that we've got with the setback how it lines up with the mid block crosswalk on State Street. And we're this is another image showing how it's set back and the activation. And, um, and then, yeah, this is just going back on onto State Street. So um, those are the changes that we've made. We do have a short like walkthrough video that'll take um, a minute. If, I don't know if people can see this. It's going to be a little choppy. Forgive me because of the, uh, the internet here because we're doing virtual meetings. But this will give you an idea of, of what it's like to go around the building. Well, it's actually very choppy. Sorry. You'll start to see some wayfinding that we're um, trying to incorporate um, right here. You're going to start to see the entrance to the residential leasing office, the outdoor dining, you'll eventually get to, um, you'll eventually get to the alley, you'll start to see art there, the Western residential entrance. Now you can see the art element that we've got covering our transformers. And then this is going around to 8th South. We've got Amy's haberdashery located there. We've got entrance to the parking garage. Um, and then we've got our retail and then um, going around to State Street, you'll see our corner retail anchor tenant as well as our makers row spaces. And then, um, and again, I apologize. It's really smooth on my computer, but I know online it's like very choppy. 
But here you can start to see the residential entry and the really cool light fixture that we're thinking of. And uh, you go back to the service alley and then back to the corner of our new street and 8th South. So those are the changes that we made. Again, we think it's a net benefit to the project. We really appreciate people's comments. We know that the facade length is a concern, um, uh, but we feel like with breaking it up with that service alley really accomplishes that goal um, of, of trying to break up that space. And we're putting in a public road. You know, we're, we're gonna be putting in a large public accessible green space. We're gonna be doing a lot of things that we think are an overall benefit to this neighborhood. And um, would love to hear your feedback on the changes that were made and um, open it up to any comments that you have. Thank you, Avir. Any comments um, or questions for the applicant? No one? Well, I appreciate uh, all the effort that you've made in just a little over a week, I think, or even less than a week. So, uh, um, and I also appreciate the, and maybe the public should know that we did have a public meeting uh, that was a design review about this project uh, not that long ago, and that's where a lot of these changes are coming from. So I I do appreciate the uh, the changes that you've made, uh, and I don't have any questions other than that or comments. Thank you, Brenda. Okay. Well, we will then go to the public hearing. Um, just as a reminder, we allow the community councils five minutes to speak on an issue and individuals have two minutes to speak. Um, there, there are ways to, to provide feedback, as Michaela mentioned um, initially at the beginning of, of our meeting. So at this point, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing um, and ask Michaela if there's anyone here or out there from the community council who's indicated an interest in speaking on this item. I'm, I'm slightly shocked, but I don't see any hands up from the public, but we do have one general email that Nick is going to read into the record. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Uh, this comment comes from Pamela Starley, and she would like this comment to be considered not only for this item, but for the other items on the, on the agenda as well. It reads, Dear Planning Commission, hello. Uh, I think this is less than three minutes long and I request to be read aloud. And my first point is that I hope, encourage and ask that you read all the e many emails that you are sent, sent to you. Since I am just a little concerned that might not happen, I'm asking mine to be heard. Thank you. Second, I want to advocate for strict adherence to construction ordinances and the avoidance of exceptions. I don't know where ordinance or Ordinances or building rules are set down, but from what I've understood, you have the power to make exceptions to them called variances. That's a question. Maybe those are part of a master plan. Maybe those have been decided upon by input from citizens in conjunction with city planning. The developer first submits a building plan to the city planning department and then may or may not have to submit the plan for approval to your commission or the Historic Landmarks Commission, I understand there are lots of steps all along the way, but I have noticed that developers routinely ask for exceptions to the rules, such as narrower easements, higher roof height, non-historical structural designs, fewer trees, and less parking. I, along with most people, I think, am concerned about parking and trees. Others might be more concerned about design issues. I'm of the strong opinion that such exceptions should not be allowed at all, or else very seldom. And the reason would need to be really compelling. It seems all a developer has to do is ask the variations are allowed. Then an already somewhat undesirable building becomes even more disappointing when its footprint is bigger, its concrete is more, its cars have no place to go. We want to feel that you're looking out for us. We are trusting and hoping and relying upon you to hear our anxieties about cars and density and other things. Will you please be conservative about the exceptions you make that don't serve the earnest desires and concerns and needs of the people around here? Some safeguards have already been put in place. Please do not diminish or remove them bit by bit, one by one. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Nick. I don't have any other hands up or any other comments. Okay, great. Thank you, Michaela. I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring the discussion back to the commission. Um, um, Madam Chairman, I have some questions for sure. the developer. Um, so I, I'm actually really excited about this project. There's, of all the projects we've seen recently, this one I've been probably the most excited about. I've uh, been walking that block. I've been really uh, researching these, the, the packet, and I like the changes that you made. So thank you for the good work and the thoughtfulness that I feel like is going into this overall project. Um, as you were showing us the video, you were talking about, you mentioned wayfinding signs. And are you, are those, are those just referring to kind of the signage that you pointed out over the entrance for the, where people can rent and, you know, the signage for a long maker's row, or are there other independent, you know, we came around the northwest corner, I think is where it was, and it looked like there was a sculpture there. What are you using so that people can really identify in this massive space? You know, how, how are you helping them break it up um, with landmarks and, and things like that? Can you talk? For yeah. Me? Yes, for sure. So yeah, the wayfinding is, is definitely in addition to um, the traditional retail signage that you would see. And like what we want to do, we're working right now. I've been in conversations with um, Derek Dyer of the Utah Arts Alliance of trying to figure out a way to create um, wayfinding that's through art. So whether that be sculptural or or something like that, we, we haven't ironed all those details out. And so in that video, you saw something that looked like a big inverted L. That the idea for that is to be some sort of art element that directs people to we're creating new city streets. So we want to let them know where they're going, but also like, here's the park and here's like an office building or here's something else. And so that's the idea in wayfinding that I was trying to talk about in the video, in addition to the traditional retail signs that you'll have around the building. Thank you. That's a, that's good to know. And speaking of, so I think this is my last question. Speaking of these new streets, um, I don't know if this is your decision. This might be staff that can answer this. Will they be named for streets that the mid block streets that were already on this block or were there ever any, or will these guys be able to just pick the names of their streets? How will that work? I'm just curious. Uh, this is Nick. I can hopefully help answer that. <laughs> Obviously, we would prefer to have the streets that have the same coordinate be named the same, a continuation of those streets, especially when they're public. This We do have quite a bit of say in the naming of the streets. Um, but depending on if there's, there's lots of things that actually go into the naming of the street and it's, it's, um, something that we'd work on with our engineering division actually who handles all that but those are the things that we consider um, normally if this were a brand new subdivision we really wouldn't care the only thing that we'd look at in conjunction with the county is making sure that the name isn't so similar to another named street that has similar coordinates so it's not confusing when um emergency services need to respond but that that's kind of how it is i i would I mean, I'll, I'll say this. I think that we would prefer to see the streets continue the historic names of similar coordinate streets if there are some. So, for example, the 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 uh, north south street um, would align with, I think, Richard Street, and so I think that would be something that we would we would want to see. Okay. Thanks. That's, I would want to see that too. And I just didn't know if that, that was going to be something they had to do or if there was some flexibility, but it's out of our purview anyway. So thank you, Nick. Thanks, Sarah. Any other comments or um, questions for the applicant? I do. So Beer, can we go to that service entrance? Sure. Let me...
Okay. So um, I do also want to say, you know, good job on responding to a lot of those things in such a short period of time. I'm wondering what's above this right there. Yeah. That if we could open this up a little bit more height wise to visually make it feel like it's almost not the same building. Yeah. I don't know what's up there. That's a great question. That, that's part of it, right above there. Ah. And so the floor is, is parking. But the, in the alley itself is two stories in volume. And so yeah. what you're seeing there, it's it's a two story volume. So it'll be, I don't, higher. It, it'll be higher, higher, than for sure. higher than I think it is. Okay. And so we kind of have art that goes in um, through here that you're going to be able to not only see on the gate, but you'll see art as you look down into yeah. The alley as well and we've got because that's where a lot of our ventilation takes place for the building there'll be exhaust going in there and um, from our generator and from back of house activities we have to keep some open air in there for air to pass through so okay. and so on the north end is that a column and then open and then the building i can't quite tell I realize on the south end that's your stairwell. So sorry, say is it on the on the north side of this entrance? Is that a column and then it's open? Yeah. And then yes. the building? Yep. So these are columns okay. where you can um, let's see. That's colonnade, actually. Yep. There we go. I just I thought it was that, but I couldn't quite tell. So thank you for that clarification. Yeah, so that's when we sure. actually step back the building. Back, originally, the building edge came out to those columns. And when oh. we step the building back, um, our architects, and they're on the line as well, they advised us to keep those columns there because it starts to define exactly what Brenda said, this colonnade. And it's um, architecturally, we just really like it. It's, it's unique and it's interesting to us. And it starts to define the, the space. I like it as well. I wanted to make sure it wasn't another solid wall jut out like the stairwell. Gotcha. So yeah. I appreciate that it, it is an extension of that colony. So cylindrical column, yeah. So could I go back to that same issue with the with the um, uh, service entrance again? Yes, yeah, so that. So you said that it was going to now be an overhead gate. Is that what you said earlier? Yeah, it's going to be a coiling door. Originally, it was going to be swing gates, and well, now that's what you show here, right? Swing gates. I I'm not really sure what is shown here. It's going to be perforated regardless. It has to be perforated. The idea is for there to be a a header or like steel beams that hold um, a box that the rolling coil door would be contained in. Okay. Okay. So, so, but above but above that would still be clear. Or open, yeah, we've shown it, it. it. It should still be. It should still be open. I don't know if structurally we're going to have to have the door go all the way to the top, but I, I think that our structural engineer has said that it can be open like this. Regardless, it has. We have to have air pass through. So either it's right. going to be open air above, or everything. Everything has to be perforated so air can f flow freely through there. And you're also. You know, because of the perforations, when you walk past, you're going to be able to see inside as well as you're walking past. It's not going to be completely solid. Yeah, I, I think that the more transparency we can get there, the better. But also, uh, um, I like the lighting effect that you have uh, shown here. And one of the things which I think uh, diminishes our sense of this being a place or a street or occupiable is the fact that oftentimes you go past these entrances, even if they are quite tall to accommodate tall trucks, for example, um, they're often very dark. And and so the, the implication that this is going to be well lit and transparent, uh, even though what when you look down, look down there, you're going to see service vehicles. Um, it's still, I think, an important component of making this um, be more like a an open entrance. Yeah, I agree with that. And our intent is to have it um, is to have it well lit. I mean, we honestly, it's going to be closed, and we shouldn't have people getting in there. But from our experience, we want it well lit, so it discourages people from trying to get in and hide out in this in this alley. So 
we echo your your comments. So thank you. Any other comments or questions for the applicant or for staff? No. Any other discussion from the commission on the application and the requested modification? Madam Chair, I'll make a motion. Great. Based on the information in the staff report, I move the Planning Commission to approve the design review as presented in petition PLN PCM 2020-00439 with the listed six conditions that are in the staff report. Thank you, Maureen. We've got a motion by Maureen. I'll second. That was a, sorry, that was a second by whom? Brenda. Brenda. Brenda, thank you, Brenda. Okay, any other discussion? All right, let's move to the vote. Let's start with Maureen. Yes, I, I think they've done a good job on this. Thank you. Amy. Yes. John. Uh, yes, I also appreciate the updates. Matt. Yes, thank you for the updates. Andreas. Um, yeah, it's a very nice design, I think, and um, happy that you brought it to the board. Uh, yes. Brenda. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Crystal. Yes. Okay, motion passes unanimously. So thank you all for working with us through the um, working session. I think it was super helpful for the project. It was helpful for us and we appreciate your time. So thank you all. Facility. So yeah, thank you all so much. We really appreciate your input. Okay. And then I I just want to respond quickly to the comment that we got from um, the public on our ability to grant variances. Just for those out there who are watching, um, the code provides the Salt Lake City Code provides for certain modifications to requirements in the zoning code. Um, there is a process that applicants can go through to request a modification. There are standards that apply. We evaluate each application based on those standards. And if an applicant meets the standards, then that's um, a reason to approve the requested modification. So the process is embedded in our code. The code is approved by the city council through legislative action. We simply administer the code and what the city council has approved as part of the ordinances. If there are concerns with the, the ability to obtain the modifications, the, those issues should be raised with city council at that level. They're the ones with the authority and the purview to make those changes to the code. Um, and also just to clarify, these modifications are not variances. Variances are very specific request under um, under state law, in fact. So there is a process for those as well. But I just want the public to understand that we're not here making um, changes based on our own whims. There's a process for this and there are standards that apply. OK, editorial comment is now done. Thank you, Adrian. That was great. OK, so now we are moving on. Um, to item number three, the Cozo House Apartments design review at approximately 157 and 175 North 600 West and 613, 621, 625, and 633 West 200 North. This is case number PLN PCM 2020-00258. Um, and again, I have to recuse myself, so Brenda will take it from here. Okay, thank you. Oops. All right, so uh, our uh, Caitlin Miller is the staff person will be presenting. Thank you, Vice Chair and members of the Planning Commission. I'm happy to be with you this evening. Thank you to the members of the public in attendance. We're very happy to have you here. Let me see.
So this is a request for the Kozo House Apartments. It is a design review application that is coming before you to request a modification to the maximum length of a street facing facade, which is found on the northern face of the structure, as you can see in this rendering here. Let's see. There. Sorry, having some technical difficulties. Um, staff's recommendation is approval with the conditions as outlined in your staff report. This is a mixed use multifamily building with 312 units. It will be approximately 67 feet in height, which is, um, I'm sure as, as you are um, well aware, a very different scale from the surrounding neighborhoods. It is across the street from the SR3 and SR1A zone where we have some existing uh, detached single and two family residences. And there are also some uh, detached single family residences across the street to the east kind of sandwiched between this proposal and an existing um, multifamily building as well. The seven subject properties are outlined in the map on the right in orange. As you can see, it um, encompasses a number of parcels between 200 north and 600 west at that northeast corner. Uh, the applicant is also proposing the inclusion of some commercial amenities as part of this project, uh, equating to about 7,200 square feet of commercial amenities. So this is a um, project site plan showing the overall footprint of the Kozo House project. As you can see, this northern facade is approximately 300 feet in length. So the applicant has proposed the inclusion of this 30 foot wide amphitheater style staircase to break up and further modulate the building and um, kind of make it feel like the facade is, is not quite so solid. As you can see, they've also included some landscaping and street trees as well as, as some public amenity spaces as part of the project. This is a drawing of the ground floor of the project. Um, there will be an entrance to the parking garage on the north side from 200 North here. And then that will service this level of parking. And then from 600 West down in the bottom right hand side of your screen, there is a second entrance to the parking garage, which will lead to more parking stalls below. Um, one of the items that staff has received multiple concerns about from the public after the notice went out for this is the amount of parking that is required for this development. So table 21A. 44.030 would require 215 parking stalls for this development, but it is located in the TSA UCT zone, which allows a 50% reduction. That reduction would bring the number of required parking stalls down to 107. As further note, this zone also imposes a maximum number of parking stalls at 1.5 stalls per dwelling unit and three stalls per thousand square feet of usable space. So the maximum allowed number of parking stalls would be 492. The applicant has provided 141 as part of this application and has met those criteria. Now, additionally, in your staff report, there was a note of a request for a maximum length of a blank wall and a maximum distance between doors. However, uh, upon further discussion with the applicants, um, the plans that were submitted as part of this proposal were not permit level. So the applicant is uh, not requesting those two modifications. They are intending to um, add louvers and a treatment to the um, blank wall and they will be adding more doors at the permit level. So the only modification that they are asking for at this point is for that um, maximum length of a street facing facade that we discussed earlier. So we've got a couple renderings of the project here. This is the Kozo House Apartments as viewed from the um, north looking southeast. 
And we have some site photos of the existing homes and the surrounding neighborhood for your consideration. So a uh, notice was sent out to the Fair Park Community Council. Staff did not receive any comments or any request for a presentation from the Community Council. An early notification was mailed out to property owners and residents in June. And of course, we follow that up with the public hearing notice. We did receive roughly a dozen um, comments, which were included as part of your staff report packet and some further attachments. And then we have also received a couple dozen comments in the past few days. So we have uploaded those to your Dropbox for your consideration as well. And I don't want to take any more time away from our applicants um, since you know they'll be able to um, present the, the narrative of the project and the, the overall vision. So um, this concludes staff's presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. I have a question. So what is the setback off of 200 North? It is zero feet. So the building is built to the property line. 200 North is a very wide right of way. It's about 130 feet from back of sidewalk to back of sidewalk. So it looks like there is a lot of space between um, the building and the street, which is typically utilized as a landscape setback. However, they are building to the property line. So when we see in figure five of the staff report, uh, the very large tree lawn, that remains, correct? Correct. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, I had uh, David as presenter one and I don't see him on the attendee list. So I made Dallin the presenter, Dallin. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm here, Dallin. So I'm with David as the architect. I'm actually the applicant. David submitted the uh, application originally as the architect for the project, but we're, we're both here together, so we can uh, we can both answer. <laughs> hey, Brenda, you're muted. So, would the applicant like to present, please? Yes, thank you. I'll present now. Let's see if I can get to this screen, screen one. Right there. Is that presentation working now? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, um, my name is Dallin Jolly. I'm the applicant for Cozo House Apartments on 200 North and 600 West. Um, just a, a quick overview of the project. It's a mixed use multifamily project. It'll have 312 apartment units. 202 of those will be studios. Um, 110 of them will be one bedrooms. There'll be uh, some retail for at least three commercial units is what we're proposed. Um, a local grocer or similar, a restaurant and then a service-based retail. Uh, providing 147, so that's one clarification, 147 stalls, uh, electrical, electric vehicle car share program, and some bike storage and maintenance. Uh, the project vision, so the unit mix is to support the neighborhood. Cozo House has been designed and programmed to meet the city's master plan for the area and the purpose of the TSA UCT zone. In contrast to what is traditionally being developed downtown, the Cozo House unit mix focuses on studio and one bedroom units. The building is comprised of 65% studios and 35% one bedrooms, attracting a transit oriented tenant, which is, is contained in the stated purpose of the TSA UCT zone. Concerns have been raised about the gentrification. To address these concerns, Cozo House studio units will target rents at a 70% AMI. This is really important to us, uh, providing a more affordable option for tenants who rely on UTA transit daily. The a building provides much higher quality units at rates consistent with rents that are currently on the property and in the neighborhood. The design modification request, um, we're requesting the building facade length request. As Caitlin mentioned, there was two other requests in there that we are actually uh, willing to comply with that we didn't realize that were not on the permit set. 
Um, so the, the only request will be the 200 uh, foot facade length. Um, th there's been significant thought and effort went into the building and landscape design associated with the conditional use request. Local landscape architect Loft 64 brought wonderful ideas. We worked together to create an entire break of the building's facade at the 200 foot mark. It's actually at the 160 foot mark. Uh, as indicated in the code and introduces the articulation of the building above with open air balconies. We then designed a ground floor solution, which includes public outdoor space to, to gather, work, relax, and meet. Amphitheater style seating and landscaped areas were introduced to facilitate, facilitate an open feel into the building's courtyard. This was vitally important to create a beautiful and usable space for commercial patrons as well as the local neighborhood to engage with the tenants. We also went to great lengths to design and invest in plan to invest in beautifying and maintaining the park strips with new plants and more seating for public use. Um, here's just a, a rendering of that articulation and the break. The required break in the code requires 20 feet. Uh, we provided 28 foot of a break here, and it's a full break from top to bottom, um, which allowed us to have an opportunity to do something with that space rather than just have a break. We wanted to activate it. And so that's what we came up with this publicly used kind of amphitheater style seating, co-working for the local coffee shop, grocer, uh, and working space that's landscaped. That also has a uh, double height above um, a grade of the first floor to the uh, balcony above. So it lets a lot of air and light through that building. This is a poor screenshot. This shows a landscape render uh, or landscape plan of the break and articulation of that space. Um, our design vision, we feel, is the most uh, efficient form of design for this building and for the area. Uh, the reason we're requesting the design modification is to better serve the neighborhood and tenants. If the request is denied, we'll be forced to redesign the building into two separate buildings, which has been explored and results in the following detrimental impacts that we'd like to um, bring to uh, the Commission's attention. One is that it will actually reduce the parking because the uh, code reads that the building would have to be broken all the way to the ground floor, continuous through the building. That, that extensively limits the amount of ground floor space that we have that we're currently using for parking. And that as, as of right now, we have an entrance just um, to the west of, of this articulation. So that becomes quite a bit of a problem, especially because parking is already an issue in the zone and we're absolutely appreciative of that and we're aware of that. That's why we decided to um, ex exceed the limited, the parking that's actually required by uh, 40 stalls. Um, this design allows us to have a building that is the most efficient as far as price. Uh, the resulting new unit mix, um, if this is if this uh, has to be broken up, would result in more expensive units, unfortunately, limiting affordable uh, options and the 70% AMI target, which is one of the most important goals of the project. Just talking about that a little bit, we are uh, really sensitive to affordable housing. Um, we have in our company, we, we focus on ADUs as well with modal and, and to provide affordable housing options to a lot of different people. Um, this building was designed in full emphasis of providing affordable housing options within studios. That's why our unit mix is different. It's uh, very different than the standard. That's why it's traditionally studios and one bedroom. So we can keep our uh, rents at more affordable prices for the area. And that really focuses on the TSA's master plan vision of the zone to allow a transit oriented tenant to be able to use uh, the facilities of the of the, T, uh, the tracks and, and other uh, facilities that the TSA zone is, is encouraging. The other thing that we want to uh, talk about is that decreased public use. So if the building gets uh, split all the way in half, as, as the build by rights states, it really um, it cuts that public use kind of amphitheater style seating, and it would basically make it have to be a driveway or an alleyway driving. And so we think that the articulation of the building, the balconies provided above the open air space through and the amphitheater style seating is a more efficient design uh, for these three reasons. Um, that ends my presentation and I wanted to turn it over for questions. I know that there's a number of public comments that I would be happy to address and answer any questions that we have um, and, and for the commission as well. Thank you. Uh, do the commissioners have any questions for uh, down for the applicant or his architect? Um, I do. I'm so on. Um, well, I can't see the page number on my 
in my report. But um, one of the photos that's showing the length that we're looking at, I think that that would be um, second north where the, the length really goes down. That is a dead end, right? That's correct. That's dead end. So, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be offensive in any way, but when I look at this, it feels like an office building. It doesn't, um, it, it doesn't have any characteristics to me that uh, seem to activate public spaces. And if I'm looking at this particular rendering in the staff report, Along um, Second North, that that public amphitheater break seems so far down, but it might not be. But it seems so far down, closer to the dead end, that I think it also misses any opportunity to try to make this not feel like an office building, and bringing it closer to Six West in a way that I, I think that this would do much better if you were somehow in the design activating that corner because right now it all looks the same. It all, it may not function the same, but it sure looks the same. And I think you've missed an opportunity to really address that corner to activate it and bring the break up a little bit closer to that corner so that uh, it, it had some use to the public because that's a dead end. And I'm not saying that you should, not pay attention to the design down the dead end because across the street you have neighbors who who want to see some things but i think you've missed a lot of opportunities to really hone in on that multi-use that um to make this feel more of an amenity to the community and to make me want to uh to see this break as a as a positive um that's i'm struggling at that point right now yeah, I'm happy to address that. So to, to meet the code is, is a 200 foot length. Our, ours uh, from the corner of the property goes 160. Now that can be brought closer to the corner, but we, we have to be sensitive to the other side as well, not ex to, to not exceed the 200 foot length. So we're, we, we're trying to position it as close to the mill. We can move it slightly, but we gotta be sensitive. We can't move it all the way to the corner because then we'd still exceed our maximum facade length on the west portion of the building. Yes, I, I still think that we are missing a lot of opportunities along that length to make it feel more open. Um, that we're you're just not hitting it. You're not you're not quite you're not there at all in terms of why I would want to uh, approve a break in in there. I'm not I'm not saying I don't want to, but with this design and how this is functioning, I don't I don't see it. Um, meeting the spirit of how we look at this um, facade length when we look at how do we, I mean, if you just look at the one we just did, we paid a lot of attention to how it functioned, but everything around it was open and activated. And, and I'm not seeing that here. Yeah. 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 One of the other things I'd like to just bring up was the activation of the retail. So we, the reason that we have it a little bit further down, we brought it as close as we could, but we really wanted that corner to focus as the retail activation on that side. Um, the, the break was something that had happened after the design and that we wanted to design in, but the, the, what we thought was the most important was the activation of the retail on those sides being the grocer, the tavern. We do have our, um, our uh, tenant uh, entry for the leasing office, and then we have another coffee shop. So breaking it up would push some of the retail because we're required to have 80% glazing on the building. It would push a lot of the retail to the west side, which we thought would be better to have that activated more towards the corner and have the break be kind of at the essential point. So, I, but I appreciate that and I, I understand that. I, I'll, I'll kind of jump in. I, you know, I, the upper portion doesn't bother me as much. I think the smaller scale of, of the openings make it does make it feel, um, you know, scaled towards residential. I think there's some, maybe it's some material choices that make it feel, you know, more commercial. But I think my bigger problem, I guess, would be the, the retail on the ground level is pretty generic. Um, and I'm okay to sacrifice personally the uh, some of that 80% of the glazing to create more approachable storefronts. Um, or create some some breakup in that facade because it just feels very monotonous and repetitive. Um, 
have you guys looked at anything on that facade ground level? I mean, um, how can businesses customize? How can businesses make it feel like it's part of you know their business and not just one generic, long, monotonous row? Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I think we tried to uh, introduce as much glazing as we possibly could on that side. On the 600 uh, west side, you can see that's all actually one tenant, which is that grocer besides the uh, the parking, um, the uh, the garage entrance. So we wanted it to be glazing. Now that is going to be a whole, you know, slew of things from, from uh, signage and wayfinding that, that will occur there, but we're open to exploring that again. We wanted to not have blank wall and we wanted to have that glazing there. So we introduced uh, the maximum amount of glazing that we could on that front, instead of having blank wall, we wanted to have the glazing there. Um, but there is more things that we could probably introduce to, um, visually attract uh the retail side of it so it's not just a massive glazing as as currently uh proposed but we didn't want it to be a just a big blank wall because that's a big thing in the code as well so not have some blank wall but there could be some articulation that's presented as well i appreciate the comment yeah i i uh i'm not advocating for like 25 different facade materials or, or anything crazy like that but i think just breaking it up either through color or, or some way of articulating that there are separate businesses and it's not just one big facade. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you. Uh, I, I, quick question. Oh, yeah, sorry. So, uh, I mean, this is a design review and not like a plan development or something else. And so the, these questions about their target of reaching seven I minutes mean, for staff, uh, reaching 70% AMI for their kind of rental rates, that's not really attached to this project anywhere, or at least at least in our what we're doing tonight. You know, requiring that kind of you know below market rates or anything like that. That's that's not tied to to this in any way, shape, and form tonight, is it? That's correct. It is not tied to the design review of their application. All right, and there's no like standard in it, even like requires or ties you know affordability yeah. rates or anything to. So there, it's just something that they're committing to here, but not, it's not required. Okay. Thank Or it's not like required or can we required of them. Okay. All right. Thank you. My question is related. Can we tie it to anything we do tonight? This is Nick. You mean the affordability component? Yes. Um, well, there'd have to be one of the design review standards that discusses that somehow. And um, I can look real quick, but I don't think there is. If there's not a standard, then then we can't we can't condition something um, outside of that standard. If that makes sense. Now, if they're pro it might be a little bit different if they're proposing it and that's their plan, but if that proposal component the the percentage of their, their market um, resident um, is something that the code doesn't allow them to or doesn't require of them, and then we can't we can't necessarily hold them to that. Thank you. Is there are there any other questions for the applicant before we open the public hearing? Okay, I'm going to open up the public hearing. Um, is there anyone here who would like to speak? Yes, I have. Please raise your hand. Your little hand. I on have the... Eliza, Eliza McKinney. I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead, Eliza. Hi. Hi. Um, I also sent an email, but I just wanted to address some of my concerns. Um, I am worried about the parking of what strain this is going to put on the neighborhood. It seems like, especially with so many studios, there's a lot of cars that are going to come along with this development um, that don't have a parking space. So how is the rest of the neighborhood going to deal with that? Um, I also just think the fact that it's not broken up in the design really makes it dominate this neighborhood and kind of take over the neighborhood. It doesn't really fit in with the residential aesthetics. Um, I'm also a little worried about the outdoor space. Um, they have this 
sort of like amphitheater seating. Um, if there is a tavern there, that just seems like more loitering space. So I'm not sure how residents within the building would feel about that. Um, and then I do have a question about if there's other outdoor space that's open to the public or if it's just to residents. Um, and I think that's all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot to mention, is there anybody from a community council here? Okay, thank you. Uh, everyone else will have two minutes to speak. Great, I have Jared Hall. Jared? Uh, yes, go ahead, you have two minutes. Sir? Jared Hall? Yeah. Go ahead, please. Jared? Hello? Can we? Hello? Jared, we, we can hear you. Oh, you can Jared? hear me? Yes, can we you can. please stop okay. hitting the mute button? I think that's I'm unmuting you, and then you're muting yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> <For us. laughs> Go okay. ahead, sir. Um, yeah, so I live on Six West and about Fourth North, and I am super excited to see this project come in. The houses it's replacing have been in not great shape for the twelve years I've lived here. I, I'm super excited to see. I mean, some potential retail coming in here, like it's great to live so close to the city, but it also, anytime I want to go anywhere without a car, it feels like I live forever from the city and seeing these sorts of businesses come in here. And I understand that we need a certain amount of density in order for those businesses to survive. I think this project is doing a great job of that. I'm for me, I think the, the way they're breaking up the 200 foot facade length is a pretty great solution like adding that sort of public or at least semi-public space that connects that kind of provides some amenity for the public for the building i think is great and also like it doesn't show much in the rendering that is shown now but looking at the site plans it looks like they're doing a really excellent job with the park strip way and providing a lot of public amenity there there's not typically provided in apartment complex. So that's all. Thank you. Is there, okay, we have a bunch of hands here. Michaela. Goodness, I didn't mute myself. Jason Walker. Uh, yes, I'd like to first thank the Planning Commission for all their great work. I live on 459 North, 600 West. Um, my concerns deal with parking. Over the last couple of years, we've had a couple of give projects in the neighborhood. The parking stalls have been uh, very, very few and far between with the idea that being in a transit zone, people would use the transit. Unfortunately, they haven't been using the transit. And as a result, the neighborhood has become clogged so that my major concern is we'll be left with 170 apartments or so that don't have parking and that will flow into the neighborhood. Um, I don't know if we can do anything about this project, but in future projects, if we can consider that we have the theoretical good of being in the transit zone and pushing people to public transit, that's great in theory but it just hasn't worked in this neighborhood. And I just wanted the planning commission to know that. Thank you. Um, Maximo. Yes, uh, my name is Max Guerra. Um, I live on 200 North, which is uh, just across the street from where this project is going in. Uh, I was the one that wrote the comments with the other uh, five owners that live on 200 North, where we raised several and numerous concerns with this particular project. Uh, none of us are against uh, growth. We just want quality growth. Uh, we kind of like the design of this building, but uh, to be honest, we're not impressed with what the uh, the number of units that are going in with this particular property. Um, 
200 North uh, is a dead end street, okay? Um, when the city station property was built on North Temple, um, the exit point spills out through the, the end of 200 North. And when city station was built, there wasn't adequate park, um, um, off street parking. So what's happening right now is basically the tenants from city station are taking up all available parking on 200 North and part of 600 West. So basically people like us who live across the street, which are basically single family homes. If we have people coming over to our house, there is no place to park usually in the evenings. And that is one of our main concerns. Um, I've been involved in uh, real estate for over 25 years. And I, I have to say that I'm, I'm, I'm shocked that the city would even consider approving these number of units, okay, with only 144 parking stalls. Where are all these uh, residents going to park? Um, where are the the uh, employees of these retail park uh, uh, spaces going to park? Where are the customers going to park? Okay. I, I'm seriously concerned about that. The other item that I have is we believe that the entry points to this particular building should be on 600 West. They should not be spilling out through 200 North. Remember, 200 North is sort of like when people go in and they're, they, they're basically having some time to turn around. There's no place where if you have all these people coming out of that unit on, on uh, 200 North, it's going to just uh, create congestion. The other concern that I have is it sounds to me based on this report, this is going to be seven levels. So one of my uh, questions I have to Mr. Jolly is, is this going to be seven levels? It sounds to be two levels of parking and then five levels of residential units on top. So that is not even fitting in with the character of this community that we have Mr. there. Mr. Garrow, your time is over. Okay. But thank you for your comments. And I, the only thing I'd like to add is the rest of my concerns are in that uh, report, in that staff report. And I would yes. ask that you please review those. Yes, we have the planning commission uh, does its homework before they get here and we all have read the comments okay. in the staff report. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Robert Rendon. Yes, how are you today? We're good. You know, I really want to echo what uh, the uh, guy before me said, you know, I live on 356 North 600 West. And, uh, it, you know, the, the parking is going to be a real issue, not to mention when the rail has events there, you know, and I worry about the safety of the children there. You got a boys and girl club right next door. And uh, I, I don't know where all these parks are going to go. And I really don't think that that fits the neighborhood. You're really talking six stories. I, I'm shocked like he is, the city would let this project go in, in a residential neighborhood. And uh, I don't know if uh, if the planning commission, did you get the email from Maria Garcia's from Neighborwork Salt Lake? We did. Can you read that? We, we have read it, thank you, yes. I mean, so, so the residents here can re hear it too. Um. We can go ahead and, and put that on our public, um, on the planning website. So you're but saying you're not going to read it, is that right? Well, the, you mean to read it out loud? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, we, we typically do not read the letters that we receive out loud. I thought you just read one just on the prior project. That was somebody who sent an email during the meeting. I did not know that. But anyway, it does not fit this neighborhood. I've lived here all my entire life, and I can't believe the city is going to let this project go. There's no mention of the safety of the Boys and Girls Club next door. He mentioned there was going to be a tavern there. How can you have a tavern when you have a Boys and Girls Club right next door? But really, this kind of project does not 
should not be on a residential street. It should be on our North Temple or, or State Street and 800 South, but not in a residential neighborhood. Time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Mr. Roberto, and there's no last name. Um, I'm Roberto and I'm with the Brown Berets. Um, and I wanted to voice my opposition to this project. Mr. Roberto, Roberto, can yeah. you give us your last name, please? Just uh, for the Sandoval. record. Say again. Sandoval. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was saying that I am against uh, this project. I think that this project has uh, no place in Rose Park, as well as similar projects anywhere in Rose Park or Glendale and the surrounding west sides. Um, I think time and time again, we see that these developments are being built um, with uh, prices that are not affordable to the people here, um, despite having like uh, a homelessness uh, issue um, and high uh, poverty, as well as uh, systematic uh, racism. Uh, we know that uh, these very expensive apartments are a contributor to gentrification, which are part um, or results a lot of times in police brutality, such as in racial profiling of citizens that are around um, and just pushing people out of the neighborhood, which have historically been here for a long time. So I ask you to oppose this and to listen to concerned citizens, not just ignore them as has been done in most projects on the west side. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I have Mar Maria Garcia. Uh, Planning Commissioners, thank you. Thank you. I submitted some written comments that that uh, I am sure that you will review. This provided some some detail in terms of NeighborWork Salt Lake's commitment uh, to Guadalupe neighborhood, which is a ten block area, and the two decades that we've spent revitalizing this area. My concern with this particular development is the number of units. Three hundred and twelve units is just way too much. The scale and the height is not compatible with the surrounding uh, developments that are in the area. City front has 166 units and 300, 300 plus parking stalls, and we still have issues with the other TSA developments that met TSA requirements who come into our parking because we have enough parking. Um, the other developments around the area are 100 to 110 units on similar size of land, so you're doubling and tripling uh, the number of units. Um, I'm concerned with a lot of the residents that are living on Second North um, who are concerned about this development, as you've heard from some of them, that they're looking to sell their single family homes because they don't feel that their voices are heard. Um, the other concern I have is the commitment from the mayor and the city council to look at equitable distribution of multifamily units. Uh, you know, there are more than 6,000 units west of State Street with uh, Salt Lake City's west side having 60% of those units. These 300 units will continue to, to add to the growth of affordable units. So I know we need affordable units, but they should not be concentrated on the west side. So please, please take into consideration the height of this building is not compatible. Uh, with the other buildings that are in that area. The structure belongs on a main corridor, not on an inner block area. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Antonio, and it says BB. Oh, uh, yes, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Can you give us your full name, please? You have two minutes. Antonio Fierro, um, representing Rose Park Brown Berets. Um, so I just echo a lot of stuff that that um, a lot of folks are saying as well. And um, we want y'all to oppose the causal house apartments. You know, this is another gentrification plan that is forcibly kicking people out of the neighborhood. You know, seven, they're planning on demolishing seven historical houses that has been there for years. All right, gentrification is violent. Evicting folks under a pandemic is pretty violent as well. 
You know, gentrification does harm to marginalized communities as this, as Guadalupe, has always belonged to the poor and working class, and there's a large population of people of color. And we have seen, um, you know, when, when gentrification occurs in this area, we see a lot of police uh, harassment and brutality that comes along with it. And, you know, this development doesn't even fit it, doesn't even fit well with this neighborhood. It just contributes to the destruction of it. So why would y'all be okay with destroying historical homes, trees, and there's a historical shop just right there as well? And it's just right next to a boys and girls club. Like, like that's that's gonna put um, a lot of like these youngsters in danger. And for the REITs uh, to have a store there as well, you know, we we have a a Guatemalan store just down the street called Quetzal Imports. You know, and this grocery store or whatever it's gonna be a restaurant. You know, what I'm saying will will put that business. You know, will will make that business go go out. You know, so. And, you know, usually like these apartments, who are they affordable? They're not affordable for poor and working class folks. You know, they're usually affordable for middle and upper class. So to preserve the integrity and culture of Guadalupe neighborhood, we ask you guys to please oppose the, these apartments. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Celine Fortier. Hello, how are is everyone tonight? Good, fine, go ahead. Great, thanks for having me. Um, I'm also with the majority of the previous speakers. Um, I live right on 600 West. We've lived here since about 2001. Um, my husband and I have raised two children who are attending local schools. Um, and what struck me about this is first, the sheer size and enormity of the complex. Um, it doesn't look like anything that should be in our neighborhood at all. Um, it, it's not, it's, it doesn't go with the neighborhood. And I think you can probably have an argument about whether the old houses go with the neighborhood, but as the previous um, person stated that this is, this is a, a previously poor neighborhood who need um, people who need working, um, who need affordable housing. Um, second, it's, I'm sorry, but it's a little Hotel Six-ish on the outside. And I think that the quality of the um, appearance is going to really further denigrate any of the neighborhood as well as the size. I think if you go out there to 200 North and 600 West, you're gonna run into several issues. The first is coming off of the North Temple Bridge um, and then going straight to 200 North. You are turning right over the train tracks of the tracks lines there. And then you're doing an immediate roundabout to get into the apartment complex if the builders do part, put a parking entrance on the 200 north side. So um, for oncoming traffic you're gonna, who are trying to come uh, south on 600 west, you're, you're creating a traffic pattern nightmare right there. Um, the other one, and I'm going to echo this again, is, um, and I sent this to Caitlin as well, is the amount of parking. Look, I'm a transit-oriented person. We live downtown for a reason. We live close to the train tracks for a reason. But we still have a car. And that doesn't – living close to downtown, living close to transit um, does not negate our need for a car. We still use it on a daily basis to get groceries, to get furniture for kids who are growing out of beds. So I oppose this. It doesn't fit the neighborhood at all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I have Sarah Lar. Pardon me. Sarah? Yes. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, I as well want to reflect all of the opposition. Um, this does not fit in this neighborhood. I agree with the traffic. Um, I do not think that it is um, well advised to create this here. Um, on top of that, you have West High right there, so that also creates extra traffic for the high schoolers. Um, and there's already um, issues with pedestrians with West High. Um, as far as the affordable housing, um, from someone who is now a proud homeowner in the area, it was a struggle to be able to uh, get affordable apartments so when they say that it's affordable, um, it's really not for like certain people that struggle or um, don't make as much money. A lot of the jobs right now are part-time 
they're not full time with great pay and benefits. Um, you have to be like really high up in, in the chain to actually afford some of these quote affordable housings. Um, Cause I have been there and I, I didn't qualify for cheap housing and I didn't qualify for any affordable housing. I was right in the middle. So that raises a concern. Um, on top of this, this is all about transit and transit in Utah is inefficient. Um, if you visit other cities, like the transit is on point, but it, here it is not. So I don't see where that even comes in as a benefit. Um, but yeah, I 100% oppose this. Um, this should not be in this neighborhood. This is a uh, single family unit neighborhood. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I do not see any other hands up from members of the public if you wish to speak. Do we have any emails from people who on this project? There were um, 16 emails that were sent into the planning public comments. All of those were put into your Dropbox. So you have those available. Um, so, yeah. You. So, seeing no further public comment, I'm going to close the public hearing and take it back to the Planning Commission for questions and discussion. But I have a question actually for, um, for um, I'm sorry, uh, Caitlin, which is um, why is this why is this being allowed at 67 feet when the maximum is 60 feet? That is an excellent question, Vice Chair. So as part of their submittal, the applicants also applied for a TSA score since they're in the TSA zone. And um, they actually achieved a score that would have allowed administrative approval of this application. Um, they've come to the Planning Commission, of course, to make the request for the design review modification. However, um, they did score quite highly on that rubric. And as part of the ordinance in the TSA zone, it does allow for one additional um, habitable story um, if you do if you do make that uh, qualifying score. So um, they did qualify for that additional habitable story, which is why it's at that 67 feet in height. It's crazy. So this is a transition area. Uh, correct. Is that correct. Um, so what's the difference between the transition area and the regular uh, uh, area in a TSA? The transition, the transition area is intended to provide a kind of a, a, a movement from the higher intensity core uses into the surrounding, um, you know, standard detached single and two family residential neighborhoods surrounding those core pockets. And this is in the transition area, is it not? That's correct, it is. So we would not expect to see a project of the utmost intensity. This transition area is meant as a place where buildings can, for example, step down or somehow uh, moderate between the scale of the neighborhood, which in this case is single family houses and the scale of the transit uh, oriented properties along fourth south correct a temple north temple um so how is it that this project is as big as most of the ones we're seeing on the transit so this this is nick i'm just going to jump in real quick here um one of the major differences between what is identified as the core area and the transition area is building height so in the core area you can actually go up to 90 feet plus get the additional um, height that Caitlin was talking about related to the to the um, development score. Okay. So that's the primary difference uh, in this location. Okay. Okay, that's all the questions I have. Is anybody anybody else on the planning commission have questions for the applicant? The applicant like to address some of the issues with the that were brought up by the public. Yeah, if, if I might have an opportunity to respond to some of the comments made. Um, okay, thank you. Um, with all due respect, I, I think a lot of the issues 
uh, brought up by the neighboring community is are not really issues with our uh, request here in design modification. It's really with the zone and what's allowed in the zone. We uh, are designed and we are uh, providing the density and the building and scale by right. And we've actually scored 238, uh, which the score on the on our TSA scorecard, which the required is 125. It, it shows that we are meeting the zoning requirement. And we're also meeting the city's master plan with what they're trying to accomplish, not only in this neighborhood, but also on this on these parcels. Um, a lot of the other things were by right as well. Um, the height was by right parking. We're uh, providing more parking than is technically required by right. Um, the a few of the other things that were by right uh, that that necessarily weren't by right, but that we, that we've done in good faith is to uh, address the uh, concern of gentrification. We do we do realize that that is a concern, and that's a concern with every development, um, and that's why we've designed our units and the density that we have at 312 unit really allows us to get our pricing down to where it needs to be to be then affordable. So that that was our approach to get density up to make our building pencil for our investors, but also really makes sense for the local community to have some affordability in the neighborhood and not attract and not put an ex extremely expensive luxury building um, here. Now it is a nicely appointed building, but the the rents will still uh, maintain affordable. Um, I wanted to address the historical house uh, comment and remark up on those houses that are there. That is not the case. None. Of, it's not in a historic zone. None of the homes are in a historic registry. And and to be quite honest, they're in really poor shape um, and they're really run down. Um, and, and this is our approach of having um, an affordable housing apartment come here that allows the same sort of tenancy that that is there. Now the parking was obviously sounds like it's the big the biggest issue and then height and density. Um, the parking is a buy right parking. We would love to provide more, but the, uh, there's just no possible way. We truly have maximized it. I think there was one comment about seven stories. As our plan currently shows, it's one subterranean parking, then one main uh, level parking with retail, and then five stories above. Um, so we tried to hide parking as much as we can in the subterrain. Um, a couple other issues. A couple other things that we want to bring up with parking is that in our in my presentation, we talk about, um, I don't know if it'll let me hear. Oh yeah, uh, we talk about electrical vehicle car share program. This has been something that's done in higher density developments in Los Angeles, Seattle, San Francisco, and New York, where we actually are, are exploring an option and an opportunity to provide electrical vehicle car share program. I think one, um, one lady had uh, mentioned that even though they tried to be transit oriented, that it's still Salt Lake City is still a driving city, and we we fully are aware of that, and then trying to be sensitive to that. So we want to provide this electric electric vehicle car share program when you going when you needing to go get groceries, go do run errands and stuff like that. That's not necessarily transit friendly, but we do want to incentivize the style of development that this is to be a transit oriented development. This is not a, this is not a development full of one and two bedroom. Um, up, uh, two and three bedroom apartments that are going to have multiple cars and, and more of a higher density yeah. family. Um, this is really uh, focused on a transit oriented tenant, which is what is in the TSA UCT zone. We are trying to comply with the master plan and also the zoning requirement. Um, I think there was a couple other things. I think one of the things that was brought up was about uh, uh, Kate's Al Imports. I personally resided in Guadalupe for the last four years. That's how I became familiar with this project and started uh, purchasing these parcels. I am very dedicated to this area. I own two uh, two other properties in the area as well, and this is a personally, uh, you know, it's it's a sensitive uh, project to me because of that. I've seen that, and I've also I want to echo with um, one of the earlier comments that to actually get anywhere um, was a little bit harder because that area, the Guadalupe, is one of the closest neighborhoods to downtown and that's why it's in a TSA UCT it's a, in a transition zone but it still does want affordability and it does it still does want the density and that's how we're able to accomplish that and and if I might I just kind of reiterate this again we are meeting all required um the, the issues that are really being brought up here have been met by the zone what we're asking for is a facade reduction or a, a facade um, break, which we've been very thoughtful about our approach there. That's what we're, we're, we're requesting in our proposal. 
And we feel like that we have done that. And I want to I want to kind of echo that that is what uh, we're here for is for that. And that what we've done and when the design of the building is providing the best use of the building and of the space, providing that we are adding affordable units. And we've tried to be very sensitive to the park strips. I know that was one other thing. The park strips there are massive. So we really wanted to articulate the park strips, add bench seating, add landscaping. That was really valuable to the area. Um, I think that's all of my comments. I think I've addressed uh, a whole bunch of them, but I would like to turn the time back over to the Planning Commission for more comment or questions or comments for me. Thank you. Does the Planning Commission have any additional comments? Nobody? Um, Madam Vice Chair, I'm wondering if we're in the comment phase where we talk amongst ourselves. Yes. Um, okay, so no more questions for the staff or applicant. Um, I, I do feel a, a sense of frustration, and I get this in every meeting, when we have the members of the public who make comments as they have, and they're very valuable. We do read them. Believe me, I think we all read them and, and think about them. The only question before us tonight is the um, extensive length over 200 feet. And I think a lot of people believe that if we oppose this, we stop this project. And I hope that the public realizes that we don't have that power. And when it comes, I just remember when I started as a community advocate, feeling very frustrated at the Planning Commission because I never got an understanding of why they didn't address a lot of the comments that we would bring up as a community. Um, parking, you know, we cannot, we cannot demand parking levels above what is required. That is set by the City Council and I encourage every member of this community to talk to their City Council member about that. We cannot make them do more than what the code dictates um, regardless of what you know you state as its impact so i just wanted to make that comment separate because i do all i feel i, I leave these meetings sometimes feeling really really badly that we're not allowing the public to feel engaged because we just ignore them but we're not ignoring you we just literally don't have the purview to address the things you bring up um, now back to the one question before us, and that is the extensive length beyond the 200 feet. I personally feel that um, this project has not, is not meeting the intent of the other projects that we um, approve beyond this 200 feet length in terms of design and how they've treated this base level of retail along um, Second North. I, I just feel like it is monotonous and it makes it feel, even though this break happens and opens up, it does not feel at all like it is meeting the intent of why we have this ordinance. I personally would be in favor of tabling this to allow the applicant to get some focus more on that retail level and, and make it more inviting. Um, so that it didn't feel like it was this long building. But if it if it goes to a motion as it stands now, I'm not in support of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in too. I I, I agree with the tabling. Um, we'd, I'd like to see some more articulation in that ground level. Um, I think creating some you know defined entries to these retail spaces will really make a big difference. Um, and I would also like to kind of echo that feeling, you know, I, I understand that people are frustrated with the added density, but our city desperately needs that. Um, whenever everyone thinks of Los Angeles, it, it, it's the, the traffic and the parking and all of those issues that, that they have, we're really headed in that direction because we are kind of up against the mountains and there's no way to spread out even further. So we really need to start densifying our cities or else we're gonna end up in a very similar situation pretty quickly. Um, you know, and, and again, the, the parking, they meet their requirements. And so that is a bigger question of what are the studies that are being done to understand that a little bit better. And it's, you know, 
the real reason for less parking is to drive people to transit and our transit systems will get better if more people use it. And the only way to do that is to, to kind of incentivize people to use that system and we'll get there. So those are my comments. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. Okay. Wasn't me. I'm sorry, but Andres. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I also wanted to kind of um, uh, uh, image those similar comments uh, for the the public, especially there are some things that we can do as a planning commission, and there are some things that we cannot do. And I would advise them to, you know, uh, be involved with their city council person, just like uh, it was mentioned, and and uh, that um, that they are concerned with. Um, when it comes to this project, I, I kind of uh, have similar sentiments. To me, it's a very um, it's a very large project. Um, I appreciate, you know, the uh, the enthusiasm and the drive to. To help with uh, density, but uh, the previous project seemed to have a different flair to it, as as I saw it, uh, and it seemed to have an inviting appeal that I don't quite see represented in this particular project. So I would be in favor of uh, uh, giving the the applicant an opportunity to go over those again um, by tabling it. Um, so those are my my two cents. Uh, so. I might be in favor of tabling it, but what are the specifics that we are looking for from the applicant? Um, I would say they need to address the second north retail frontage because that is the side of the building that is exceeding the length to give some better articulation and give some better treatment to how it is interacting with that pedestrian level so it does not look so monotonous. Because even though they have that break of what they're calling, you know, an outdoor amphitheater, it still looks way beyond 200 feet of monotonous design. Um, I would be, um, that would be what I would be looking for. Anyone else? Do I have a motion to table or any or a motion to approve or, or any other motion? Or any other comments? Barring any other comments, if I can get my work thing to work. I would make a motion. Um, um, I move that we table um, this particular PLN PCM 2020-00258 to allow the applicant um, time to address our concerns regarding the 200 North um, ground level treatment um, to to further articulate it so that we could see how they would want to um, provide differences or a different design so that we could approve something beyond that 200 feet um, extension. I'll second that. I have a motion from uh, Amy and a second from Sarah. Is there any other comments about this? Motion is to take. Madam Chair, yes. This is Nick. Real quick, um, one of the issues that we've run into when when things are tabled is whether or not you want when this comes back if you want to schedule it as a public <laughs> hearing or leave it closed. So it would be helpful for us if you, um, as part of this, make that make that decision. In the motion. Yes. Yes, please. Okay, so I would um, add to the motion that this would come back, that we've already closed the public hearing. We would not open that back up, seeing as we did not get any public comments really addressing the length issue, which is the question before us. So keep the public hearing closed. I don't know how else to word that, Nick. Well, one oh, thing that has come up is, is whether or not the whatever changes come back um if they're substantive enough and they change something that may require or maybe it may be worthwhile to get more public input on that specific how do you define substantive that's a good that's a good question i think if it's up to really it's up to you guys if you give enough direct 
<laughs> I, know, I know, but if you give them, if you give the applicant enough direction on what needs to change, then um, uh, they they can they can do that. Um, so, who decides if the motion is given enough direction to the applicant? <laughs> Because I would Again, think they gave enough direction, but that doesn't really mean anything. I mean, so I'll just I'll simplify this and tell you what my preference is. Thank my you. preference is that anytime there's some missing information that you guys can't use to make a decision, like in this case, that the design of that ground floor. Personally, I think the best practice is to reopen the public hearing because we don't know what we're going to get and we don't know what that may may look like. So I think that would be the best practice. Um, sure. And that's up, up to the commission though. Um, I am willing to actually follow Nick's suggestion um, because I don't know what type or level of changes the applicant may bring to reopen mm -hmm. the public hearing addressing the length of the facade and any changes made uh, to this particular design. I don't know if the person who seconded agrees with that. Oh. Yeah, I'm happy to continue my second. Okay. No, we can't hear you. Muted. We have a motion from Amy and a second from Sarah to uh, table this uh, decision until the applicant returns with an improved or at least a more uh, complete design for the ground floor. Uh, and so we're going to uh, also bring that back with a public hearing to review those um, items. Uh, so that's the, that's the what you're voting on. So I'm gonna call roll now. Uh, Andreas? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Maureen? Yes. John? Yes. Crystal. Yes. Matt. Max. Yes. Amy. Yes. The motion passes. This item is tabled. Um, thank you all for your attention. And thank you all and the members of the public for your comments. And can I ask for a clarification? When they come back in front of us, we don't need to see the whole presentation again, correct? They don't have to go through all the details. So we'll just have them go through changes. That would be my recommendation to them. Okay, I just want them to know that's what we'd like. <laughs> they, they, can, do. they can present anything they want, but you're uh, right. yes. You're right, okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna turn this back over to Adrian. Thank you, Brenda. Moving on to agenda item number four, the West End Rezone at approximately 715 West Genesee Avenue, case number PLN PCM 2020-00268, and Chris will be presenting. Hello, good evening. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so this is a request from Max Kreth and Ian Percy of West End LLC uh, to rezone the parcel located at approximately 715 West Genesee Avenue, um, a landlocked parcel located at 710 West 900 South, um, and a portion of city-owned public alley adjacent to the property located at approximately 740 West 900 South. Uh, the properties are currently zoned M1 light manufacturing, <clears throat> and the re request is to rezone them to RMU residential mixed use. Um, staff is recommending that the commission forward a positive recommendation to the city council. Um, the rezone request is related to a rezone request and two LA vacation re requests that have previously been heard by the planning commission. Those requests have all received positive recommendations from the planning commission. Uh, the parcels on the map uh, that are marked in pink are the properties that are requested to be rezoned. Um, the ones in yellow are the properties that are involved in the previous rezone request. Um, and then these are the two alleys that were involved in the previous rezone request. You can see the one here in orange and then the one down here in pink. Uh, the applicant's um, intention uh, for the subject area is a commercial multifamily development. 
Um, there are currently two vacation or two vacant commercial buildings on the site that are intended to be redeveloped for restaurant and commercial uses, while the eastern portion of the subject area will be developed as multifamily. Um, subject properties are located west of um, I-15, between 700 west and 800 west, and north of 900 south. Um, several community uses surround the subject site, including the Nine Line Trail, Nine Line nine line dirt jumps and pump track um, and community gardens. The surrounding properties on the block are zone M1, however, uh, with exception of just a few properties, the primary use is predominantly family residential. Um, there's also a, a religious use adjacent to the east um, of the subject property. Uh, the block to the north is, of the subject property is also surrounded or is also zone M1 with uses that include commercial and light manufacturing type uses, as well as some residential uses. Um, the block to the south of the subject site is zoned M1 with current uses that include Utah paper box, uh, moving and storage warehouses and other light manufacturing uses. Uh, block further south of the proposed rezone are zoned R15000 single family residential and RMU35 residential mixed use. Uh, blocks to the east on the other side of I-15 are zone CG um, general commercial. Um, here are some site photos. Uh, the top left shows the subject parcel at 715 West Genesee Avenue. And the top right photo um, shows the subject alley looking north from 900 South. Um, in the photo, you can see um, this area down here um, is the area that um, would be requested to be rezoned. Um, if the alley vacation is approved by um, city council, then they would like to include that portion of alley into their subject property and include it in the rezone um, of that property. Um, it would not include the entire alley that is to remain open. Um, the bottom two photos show the entire development area as seen from 900 South. Um, this slide shows photos of the development around the subject area. Um, here you can see in this top right or top left photo um, is the religious use, and then you can see um, some residential and um, some community uses and some manufacturing kind of further behind there. Um, there um, these are the keys to consider when reviewing this rezone request. Uh, first consideration is existing city plan guidance. Uh, the property lies within the west side master plan area. The rezone request aligns with uh, many policies found within this plan. Uh, the plan includes several goals for increasing the community's residential density. Uh, the plan suggests adding more commercial and multifamily residential infill. Um, should be pursued when the opportunity for development arises along the corridor. Um, consideration should be given to permitting residential and commercial infill on vacant parcels in the industrial corridor. Height and bulk um, regulations for infill development should be as flexible in order to achieve high density development, uh, which is 50 or more dwelling units per acre. Um, identifying um, underutilized or unmaintained areas within large residential blocks in the west side. These mid block areas should be targeted for development through flexible zoning and design standards. Um, the rezone request helps to promote the visions found in the nine line master plan. The subject area is defined in the plan as a major gateway along 900 south and a minor gateway at 700 west. Uh, by allowing the property along these gateways to be redeveloped, um, adding commercial and multifamily residential uses will increase the visibility and welcome potential corridor users, um, the appropriate amenities and infrastructure. Um, the pro proposal will also help meet the goals found in Plan Salt Lake and Growing SLC, which aims to promote infill and redevelopment of underutilized land, address lack of housing options in Salt Lake City, and attempt to preserve and enhance neighborhood and district character. Uh, the proposal will help meet goals found within the transit master plan. This plan identifies 900 South as a high priority corridor as it provides opportunity for east, west, um, cross town connections. Uh, the transit master plan recognizes the importance of land use, street connectivity, and placemaking to implement a well used 
an attractive frequent transit network. Uh, the frequent transit network must be supported by concentration of land uses, connections to key destinations, a rich mix of uses and interconnected streets. The proposed development of commercial and residential uses that can be permitted with the approved or with the approval of the requested zoning amendment will add a mix of uses as well as add key destinations to an otherwise unutilized area. Uh, these uses will allow for the activation of streets and increased mobility throughout the neighborhoods. Um, the second consideration is design standards. The proposed RMU zoning district only has two design standards that would apply to any new development under this zoning designation. Um, these standards are a 40% ground floor glass requirement for facades facing a street and a and the 15 foot maximum length of any blank wall uninterrupted by windows, doors, art, or architectural detailing at the ground floor level along any street facing facade. Under the RMU design standards, something like um, structure parking could be located on the ground floor, which would not be consistent with the active pedestrian oriented design envisioned in the master plan for this important gateway. Uh, master plan policies in the area, as well as planning best practices suggest that a new development in this area would be or would benefit from the additional design standards, such as an active ground floor and durable building material requirements on ground and upper floors to encourage pedestrian activity and the vibrant active mixed use gateway into the west side neighborhoods. Planning staff is of the opinion the design standards in section 21A.37 applicable to the D2 zoning district should be applied to any new project on the subject parcel developed under the proposed RMU zoning district. Uh, one way this could be accomplished is through a development agreement. agreement. Development agreements can only be approved by the city council. Um, the subject property is within the boundaries of the Poplar Grove Community Council and within 600 feet of the Glendale Community Council. Early notification was sent to the Poplar Grove and Glendale Community Council chairs requesting um, comments for the proposal. Neither the applicant nor the staff were asked to attend a community council meeting. Um, early notice was also sent out to property owners and residents within 300 feet of the subject area. Um, no public comment was received as of the publication of the staff report. However, a, kind of, a comment was received today that you um, all should have. Um, a letter supporting the project was received from the Glendale Community Council Chair and is included in, in attachment G of the staff report. Um, again, staff is recommending the commission forward a positive recommendation to the city council. And that is the end of my presentation. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, and we have the applicant who's here and would like to speak. I have a couple of questions for Chris. Okay. Um, Chris, you just mentioned that we should have received a, a separate comment from the Glendale letter. Uh, no, the Glendale comment was in the staff report, but then yeah, I saw that. Email. Did you just say you received one today, though? Um, we received um, a comment today that should have been put in your Dropbox. I do not see that in my Dropbox. Um, it should have been placed in there today from. John. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking like in it right now, and I do not see a separate comment. Okay, um, I believe. Um, the, so maybe during the public hearing, we can have Nick read that in, so that we can hear it. I'm just going to okay. assume that none other, no other commissioners also see it because it's not showing up in my Dropbox. Um, Chris, I don't have that. Can you forward it to me so I can read it? Thank you. Yes. Okay. And the other question, Chris, I have. So I wish I had a perfect memory, I, but I know we we we've seen this one before. And I feel like, in addition to this alley issue, we talked about height and whatnot. What did what else did we see on this parcel previously that wasn't addressed that now we're seeing this request for a rezone? Do you know? Um, so you were presented with an, um, a rezoned request um, from Amy Thompson um, that was talking about um, some 
some high, well, I'm sorry, um, some high density um, residential that would be on the east side of the parcel um, and some redevelopment of a couple of existing warehouse buildings that are on the west side of the parcel. Mm -hmm. um, the applicants have a building permit in um, the system for the commercial parcels, but um, not an official proposal for the um, multifamily. And that, uh, I guess the applicant can address this a little bit further because, ah, yeah, I feel like we we had huge discussions about this. And um, just to the applicant, maybe address a little bit about what we've seen before to refresh my memory, because I know we've talked about it, but I, I need the details again. So thank you. Okay, um, just one second, let me, I can pull up um, <clears throat> some of the proposal for that, um, just one second here. There is the, the sheet in the staff report that talks about the prior approvals that we or issues on this particular site. Um, previously. Help, help me what page is that on, Adrian? It's on PDF page 10. My, you know, my staff report doesn't have page numbers. Well, I just go to just the page. Yeah. So 10 of the four, I don't even get that. Five, six, <laughs> seven, eight, nine. Uh, my page 10 is a map. So those were like the prior alley vacations that we looked at. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't it's know. on the map. Amy, it is the map. It is the map? It is the map. Right. Okay. And it's sideways. Got it. Got it. Thank you. It's hard to read this way, but it, it does identify um, the most recent ones, at least, that we looked at concerning those alley vacations. And now it looks like we're looking at a rezone for a parcel that was east of what we previously looked at that wasn't included in the project. So, cause I feel like the, uh, I mean, this parcel was the whole parcel we talked about previously. Are we rezoning the entire thing, including the commercial parts that we've already talked just, about? Chris? The red spot on that map is all we're looking at now. Yeah. Yeah. Let me put that back up. I'm sorry. Um, so the only so this is kind of in addition to what was rezoned. Um, if I can get this to stop. Okay. Yeah, and I um, apologize. Like I read these, but sometimes the context of the your presentation and the meeting bring up a lot more clarification that I need that I can't quite grasp when I'm reading the report. So. I appreciate you taking this extra time for me. Yeah, of course. Um, so are you able to see um, the, the presentation again? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the it this is kind of, there's been multiple um, applications for this project. Um, the area in yellow, um, this was the area that was presented by Amy um, back in 2019. Right. Um, to rezone from M1 to RMU. Um, the area in pink here, and then this little uh, thing going to be in addition to that. So we're thing. only looking at that sliver yeah. tonight. Yeah, uh, so this and then the alley. And the alley is dependent on um, city council approval. Um, if they So we're looking the, at both the, the purple this. sections, the corner bit, and then this on the northeast side that's what we're looking at tonight yes yes um okay i totally get this now thank you i i i read it a little different in the staff report so thank you no problem okay any other questions for chris before we move on to the applicant no okay is the applicant here? I'm here. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, we can. All right, good evening. Thank you. Um, I, th I think you kind of took the wind out of my sails. 
uh, by just doing all that stuff. Um, I was just going to remind you on on kind of what was approved. I, you know, it seems like yesterday, but I guess it was in 2019, uh, the rezone and, and really why we're coming back. And I know we've come back a few times. Unfortunately, this project has, has proven to be a little bit trickier with the alley and other things, but, but this is totally unrelated to that in the sense of we just had the opportunity. We, you know, the the owner of that house came to us and said, "Hey, would you buy that house?" And and we decided to, you know, we decided to purchase it. And and the ability to combine it with the rest of the site to sort of square it off was was really attractive. And then we we got the little sliver from from the you know the county. So really, we're just in front of you guys tonight to just ask to sort of include that in in, in the in the rezone from from M one to what we're what we had to, you had agreed uh, previously. I want to keep it short. I, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but I think that's essentially what, what we're asking for tonight. Great. So Thank I want to correct any questions. Uh, yeah, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, am I correct that um, this particular that um, uh, that what we have already looked at really is the are the re are uh, the redoing of the two buildings in the alley and we don't have a plan for the rest of the site, correct? We don't have a plan approved for the rest of the site. Uh, that's correct. The applicant? Yes, for the applicant. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, all, all that is currently in the works is, is a phase one, which is the, the adaptive reuse of those two commercial buildings, right. which we've been working on for the last six months to get a building permit. I, I think Chris meant in it we're, we're very close but but we're not quite there yet all right so when we add this particular parcel that doesn't change your design because you don't actually have a design that's that's being Correct. part it's being considered right now by the planning Correct. commission okay thank you what's the status of your other approvals How, has the other zone rezone gone through and the alley vacations? Um, so one alley has been um, approved already. Um, it, it's the Northern alley that was requested to be closed. Um, the alley zone um, and the other alley um, vacation requests are in the transmittal process to the city council. So they're, still, they're pending, okay. Any other? Questions for Chris or the applicant at this point, from the commission? No? Okay. Thank you for um, talking with us. I will go ahead and open the public hearing. Again, community council members have five minutes to speak. Individuals have two minutes to speak. I'll ask Michaela, is there anyone here from the community council or Nick? Uh, Madam Chair, real quick, um, I did drop put that letter from that was received today in the Dropbox, so it is there now. That person also indicated they would like to speak, and since I have the microphone, we do have a community council representative, um, Dennis Ferris, but I don't have the control to unmute them, so hopefully Michaela can do that. I can do that. Dennis. Dennis. Lovely. You can speak, sir. Thank you. Um, I'll keep it fairly short and sweet. Just wanted to reiterate our ongoing support for this project um, from the community. It's a fantastic thing that we would love to see happen quickly. This seems to be a, a mere technicality to tack on these little pieces and uh, move the project forward. On a quick side note for the Planning Commission or for Nick, um, I had a lot of technical difficulties tonight and kept trying to log it log out and log back in, but it wouldn't allow me to without an ID code that I never received. So I ended up using three different email addresses tonight to stick around for you guys. So oh, thank you for your patience. Thank you for letting us know. Thanks, Dennis. We'll look into, into there and hopefully avoid having that happen to others. Sure thing. Okay. Is there, do we have others queued up? Yep, Ross, uh, Ronald Russell. All right, thank you. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. 
All right. Yeah, I, I'm, I suspect, I, I can't see what letter you're looking at, but I suspect it's mine since I submitted it. Um, I'm an attorney. I represent the Summum Church. They own the parcel that's located on the northeast uh, corner of this block that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the Gold Temple that's there, which I, I believe is an important uh, part of the city's cultural fabric. The, the temple is where they, they worship. And it's uh, important and significant to their religion. Uh, the, the objection and concern that we wanted to raise is reiterated in my letter. I won't, I won't to repeat everything that's there, but uh, Suman's concerned and objects to the, the, the zoning that would permit 75-foot buildings to essentially surround its temple and grounds. The property is located uh, at a, in an elevation much lower than where I-15 is located, which is right adjacent to it. So it's below the freeway noise right now. If 75-foot uh, buildings are surrounding its property now, you'll end up with reflected noise that's going to essentially make it uh, difficult, if not impossible, for them to have the peaceful kind of worship experience that they've enjoyed in the past. We've pointed out um, in the letter that I did send that uh, under the Federal Religious Land Use and Institutional Persons Act, that the government can impose, cannot impose, or implement a land use regulation in a manner that it, in, a, in a manner that imposes a substantial burden on the religious exercise of a person, including an a religious assembly or institution, unless the government demonstrates that imposition of the burden on that person, assembly, or institution is in furtherance of a compelling governmental interest and is at the least restrictive means. So we submit that a lower zoning, the uh, RMU 35, would be less intrusive. Um, so I've submitted that comment. That's the comment from uh, the Summum Church that we wanted to submit to make sure that's part of the record. Um, in addition, I believe that Ron uh, Temu is probably one of the participants and would probably like to speak as well, uh, specifically for what the impacts would be on the church. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Summum Temu is with us, sir? Yeah. Yes, I am. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for finally involving us in this um, situation you've got going on. We personally, as a church, we've been here for over 40 years. We've been visited by uh, news organizations and uh, people from around the world. We've been uh, presented in, in, in different movies, different types of shows from, from National Geographic, Discovery Channel, and everything else. People come to see and spend time here to uh, enjoy the meditation here. And the major thing we have here is that this, uh, this tenement building that the New York uh, people plan on putting here in Salt Lake on, on this adjacent ground is literally going to block the sunlight from us. And for us, the sun is a very important aspect of our religion. No, we do not worship the sun, but the energy from the sun is a, a very important part of our mausoleum, which we have here on uh, our property, as well as our temple. And we feel that this is a direct and intentional move on the side of the, the city council, not the city council, but the planning commission, Poplar Grove and Glendale. I mean, they didn't even invite us to participate. And I listened to the last meeting where you allowed me to send in an email, thank you, which was uh, pretty well dismissed, that you guys didn't even include us. You didn't even involve us. New York just decided to come in here. I appreciate the fact that they live on nice estates throughout in New York and they live up in Park City and they are not here on the west side. And by putting a, over 200 people, families, and in the low income, we know that there's in the next 10 years, you're going to have lots of families in there and you're going to have the same thing that Baltimore has, the same thing that New York has. They're very good at making a lot of money and then moving on down the road, except for, of course, collecting rents. 
It's all about the money. I don't know where where you people stand, but this is our religious property. We've been here for over 40 years. We meditate here, and they plan on building a building that is literally going to block the sunlight all winter long from our property, literally. And they are going to try to, uh, it's, we consider this a direct attack on our religious rights. And we plan on staying on top of this. I appreciate the fact that New York's going to make some money. A lot of contractors here in town are going to make some nice money. But in 20 years, Poplar Grove and Glenville are going to have, as they've already explained, they plan on going west with this. So as soon as you go out of the freeway, they want to have a building that's higher than the freeway, reflecting the noise down on us. Nobody got us involved. They put a little thing on their, our thing here. We showed up at their meeting, and we waited around 15, 20 minutes. Nobody showed. And then all of a sudden, we get all of this. So we know that they don't even want to deal with this. You just want to run us out of town. I appreciate the fact that we're not part of the majority religion in this town. But we expect some sort of responsibility to our religious worship, which we feel has been completely undermined, completely overran by this monstrosity you plan on sticking in the town. We've listened to some of the other comments Thank you, about the buildings. Thank you. You're, yeah, you're I know you want to give everybody else plenty of time to talk, but you want to cut off. No, we give everyone the same amount of time and we appreciate your comments and your feedback. Thank you. Thank you for that. Michaela, is there anyone else who's indicated an interest in speaking? I am looking. I do not see any other hands up. Okay. We're good. Uh, any other emails that we've received or other comments? Written comments? Nothing else has come in. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and is, um, is it, is it possible? Hi. Is it possible oh, for me to say something? We'll bring it back to you to yes, yeah. We'll bring it back to you to respond okay. to the comments raised up during the public hearing. Um, but I just want to clarify for members of the public: this is a rezoning request. These matters come before the Planning Commission for a recommendation to the City Council. This is a legislative decision. We make a recommendation. We are not the final decision-making authority on what's before us tonight. Um, you'll have another opportunity to bring these issues to the city council when they schedule this for a hearing. Um, so there, this is not the only time or opportunity to participate and we are not the final decision makers here. Um, okay, I'll bring it back to the applicant and give them a moment to respond. Hi, sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, it might be my bandwidth. Apparently, lots of people in my house are using the internet at the moment. Oh, no worries. Um, I, I just wanted to make a couple comments. Uh, first off, we, we actually made quite a few attempts um, to reach out to the community. Uh, we had a community meeting about this. Uh, everyone was invited. We we sent flyers to everybody. So I, I feel terrible that that. Um, the gentleman just spoke, thought that we, we weren't interested in his opinion, but, but we did have um, several community outreaches um, to talk about this. First off, second, um, I, I know that I have a residence in New York, but I also have a residence in, in Utah. Uh, and I spent, you know, six months out of the year in Utah. I'm, I'm very, I'm very much uh, feel uh, at home in Utah and I've spent, a, you know, been there for a long time. So um, just, I, I don't want to just be considered a New York person. Um, and thirdly, I think most importantly, um, you know, the, the current zone is zone manufacturing. And I just want to remind everybody that you can build up to 85 feet on, on the current M1 zone. And I, I think that's the one thing I think we talked about a lot last time as well, is that, you know, you know, it's not like this is zoned as a single family. I mean, this is M1 and, and you can actually you know, under the current zoning, which I, I don't think anyone wants manufacturing in that area. I think as per the master plan, as per a lot of other things, you know, they're looking for, you know, better uses for infill 
than than uh, manufacturing in, in, in this particular area. So just our request to, to build potentially up to 75 feet, we haven't actually come up with anything, um, is actually less than what the manufacturing zone uh, would allow currently. So um, just I just wanted to put that out there, that, that the height actually um, is, is actually potentially not, you know, we're not going from 35 feet to 75 feet. Um, and that's, um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, I will bring the discussion back to the commission. Let's see if we have, anyone has any questions again for staff or for the applicant or any other thoughts on the matter before us. Madam Chairman, I am ready to make a um, motion if the Planning Commission okay. is also ready. Um, uh, like based on the information right. listed in the staff report, the information presented, and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed zoning map amendment as presented in Petition PLN PCM 2020-00442. Okay, we've got a motion. And that was a second by Maureen. Is yep. that right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. Any other discussion? No. All right. We'll go through the roll call. Uh, Maureen. Yes. Amy. Yes. John. Yes. <laughs> Matt. Matt? Yes, sorry, I took up internet issues here, thanks. <laughs> I know the feeling. Andreas? Uh, I will vote yes. Brenda? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Crystal? Yes. Okay, motion passes unanimously. This matter will now go to the city council with our recommendation and they will be um the final decision makers on this item okay and the item number five the administrative decision appeals text amendment everybody has been anxiously awaiting this one all night this is case number pln pcm 2020-00352 and daniel thank you can you hear me okay yes okay great so this is a text amendment proposal initiated by the city council uh, and this proposal would change code in the appeals chapter of the city zoning ordinance. So just for background, the appeals chapter regulates appeals of administrative decisions. So these are decisions by the planning commission, with things like plan developments and conditional uses or the historic landmarks commission for new construction in historic districts or this or uh, decisions by city staff for the planning director uh, when we're administrating the rules for the zoning ordinance with things like building permits. So uh, when a decision is made by one of these entities, someone could submit an appeal request to the city. The appeal has to allege an error in administering, administering or interpreting the ordinance rules or regulations. And then the appeal would then be heard by an appeals hearing officer. And that officer is appointed by the mayor and is generally an attorney with uh, land use law experience. So the city code section that deals with this really hasn't changed much since it was adopted a number of years ago. And so these changes would get it up to date. And the changes are generally technical changes to comply with state code and other recent case law decisions by courts in the state. <clears throat> so there are a few main changes. Uh, the first is to clarify the authority of the appeals hearing officer in the code itself. So the city appeals hearing officer only has legal authority over city coded processes, not state code. But that is not called out specifically in the city's appeal, appeals code. So the proposal updates the code to make that authority clear uh, with regard to the state code allowances. So appeals dealing with state code have to be appealed to a state court for a decision, but we have received some appeals recently dealing with portions of the state code that have been problematic uh, because the authority of the officer hasn't been made clear in our own city code. 
So this would help prevent those issues and make it clear what authority the city appeals hearing officer has over uh, which sections of code. Another change is to add a reference to state code uh, to align the city's definition of an appellant, uh, which is someone who can appeal uh, something, uh, a decision made by one of those uh, entities. So the state legislature recently made changes to state code to clarify which third parties can actually submit an appeal of a land use decision. <clears throat> and so they've, they've narrowly defined uh, that person to the term adversely affected party, which means a person other than a land use applicant who A, owns real property adjoining the property that is subject to the land use application or land use decision, or B, will suffer a damage different in kind than or an injury distinct from that of the general community as a result of the land use decision. So state code regulates uh, what, what, a par what parties can appeal these decisions. And so this change would just align our own code with state code allowances. So the final specific change is that decisions would not be stayed or put on hold automatically when someone submits an appeal. An appellant would have to specifically ask that the decision be stayed in the appeal application, and then the hearing officer would evaluate it to determine if a stay would prevent some substantial harm from occurring. So that is really to avoid appeals that have no merit from just delaying implementation of the Planning Commission decision on a development. So those are the main changes. Uh, the remainder are wording and other technical changes to the code language. And on this, we are recommending approval of the amendments. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about the proposal. And uh, Paul has graciously offered to also help answer any legal questions. Great, thank you, Daniel. Any questions for Daniel or Paul? Well, I have a question. <laughs> so if there's, if there is an appeal and it involves both a state law matter and, well, I have a couple questions. How does the, who's overseeing the hearing officer to determine whether they're properly um, analyzing city code issues versus state code issues? So that's, that's the concern um, that we've had it is that uh, interpretation of state code is squarely within the jurisdiction of the courts. And um, there may have been a recent matter where uh, one of the hearing officers uh, might have disagreed with us. And, it, and there have been other issues where uh, the, this question has come up. And we don't think it's appropriate for um, hearing officers to interpret state law. That being said, um, their role is clearly when a, a appropriate to apply state law. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully there aren't any gray areas, uh, but we want to make clear that, <laughs> I know, um, we want to make clear that uh, it's not the, the hearing officer's role to interpret state law. But is that, so I guess who bets that when you have an appeal and it goes through the city and then it goes to a hearing officer, is there some process to say this is appropriate for the hearing officer versus this needs to wait and go to state court? No, I think that my office would point that out and say, yeah, that's not appropriate um, for the hearing officer to decide because it's, it's an, uh, an interpretation of state law. And if the matter proceeds beyond the hearing officer, then it'll be up to the courts to decide if that was correctly uh, decided. And if you have an appeal that involves both, then is it, um, you go through the city process first, the hearing officer here deals with the city issue, and then you take your state court issue to, I mean, state code issue to state court. Yeah, and I don't know that that would happen a lot, um, but yes. That's how, okay. Thanks, Paul. And there's there's always an opportunity for the ombudsman's office to weigh in on these things as well because they uh, have the authority to um, 
to issue advisory opinions on matters right. involving state law. Right. So, Paul, I have a non you know, lawyer <laughs> question. Can you um, help me clarify the difference between applying state law and interpreting it? Yeah, um, you, you generally apply the plain language of the law. So if, um, uh, for example, uh, subdivision provisions in state law say that uh, they, there's some provision with respect to um, when you do or don't need to file a plat, um, it, it should be fairly obvious. and. Uh, applying the law is just taking the law as it on its face um, and, and applying it to that particular case. Interpreting the state law is when there's something that may not be straightforward and uh, the hearing officer in those cases should not be putting themselves in the role of the judges who have been uh, appointed under state code to take care of those uh, interpretations. So how does a hearing officer then take a fairly vague state statute and apply it without some sort of interpretation when it doesn't, when it's not as straightforward as right. um, a plat designation, et cetera? In those cases, you would ask the uh, hearing officer to uh, pass on applying those provisions of law if it's really that unclear. I, I can't imagine this is going to come up a lot. Um, it has come up in the context of billboards. Okay. So you feel like this text amendment um, proposal addresses that fairly um, infrequent um, issue though uh, successfully? Or do you feel like you already do that successfully? Like you already direct the hearing officer when they're interpreting and they shouldn't be? Um, I, I would say it's been entirely successful uh, in that endeavor. Um, there, there have been some issues beyond interpretation of state code where uh, we have given our opinion to the hearing officers as to where those guardrails are and their authority, and they've disagreed with us. And one of those areas is um, determining whether zoning estoppel applies in a situation. And that's probably more than you want to know about. Uh, yeah, yes. As estoppel is when uh, a party relies to their detriment on something that the, the city says or does, and um, the courts generally would determine whether um, we should be prevented from enforcing an ordinance that somebody relied to their detriment on a representation of a city employee. Uh -huh. And uh, okay. it's, it's happened two or three times where we've told hearing officers, we don't think that you have that authority to determine that. Okay. And, uh, and, and twice they've disagreed with us. So okay. it's, it, it comes up. Thanks, Paul. Any other questions for Paul or Daniel at this point? All right. We will now go to the public hearing. I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, ask Michaela if there's anybody who's indicated an interest in speaking on this issue. We have about 20 people that would like to speak to this item. I bet we do. <laughs> My colleagues. <laughs> there are no hands up and no emails. In. Thank you. No. Sorry. Are you saying no one stuff. stuck around for this whole meeting for this topic? Is that Stop. what you're saying, Michaela? <laughs> no, they did not. Okay. Well. Well, that's too bad for them. 
been a while. Um, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing, bring it back to the commission. Any other discussion on this? If not, would someone like to make a motion? Again, this goes to the city council for final approval. I will make a motion. Based on the information in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed text amendment PLN PCM 2020-00352 Administrative Decision Appeals Text Amendment. Okay, got a motion from Brenda. I'll second. That was a second from, was that Crystal? All right. Maureen. Maureen, sorry. It was a mix of Maureen and Matt. We merged together. <laughs> sound like Crystal, apparently. All right. Um, okay. Yeah, it's complicated. All right, we'll go ahead with the roll call vote. Uh, Maureen. Yes. Amy. Yes. John. Yes. Matt. Yes. Andreas. Yeah, I, I want to thank Paul and uh, Daniel too for the um, legal training. That was really actually quite helpful. So, yeah. Thank you. Y yes. Okay, thanks. Brenda. Uh, yes, I actually knew what an estoppel was before this. So it's amazing. <laughs> ah, you ready for law school? Sarah? Yes. Crystal? Yes. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Off to city council you go. Um, okay, that is the end of the agenda. Michaela or Nick, anything else? We need to cover tonight. No, thank you. This was wonderful. Nothing else to cover. Okay. All right. Great. With that, we will adjourn and thank you all for your time. Appreciate it. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.